And everyone, we are now live. Hello? Hello? Good morning. Is that you, Commissioner Timmons Goodson? Yes. Good morning. Uh, operator, I can't hear her. Commissioner Timmons Goodson, I need to speak up just a little bit. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, her line has uh, been Jim? Boosted, and again, we, yes, ma'am, her line Yeah, the, the room is kind of noisy right now. Just, uh, just to sound a little bit. Thank you. Yeah, yes, ma'am, and just let you know we are live now, whenever you're ready. Thank you. We live into the voice of my no justice, no peace. We are live. Hello? You are still connected, ma'am. I believe they, they haven't actually started yet. So the line uh, may, you may hear some silence until they actually start. Doing okay, that, I just want to make sure I have not been cut off. Thank you. Where are you? Thank you. Here? La -da. 
It is commission time. Commission time. Light on, red light off. morning. So I'm going to call us to order and that this briefing of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights comes to order at 931 and takes place at the Commission's headquarters here at 1331 Pennsylvania Avenue Northwest, Washington, D.C. I'm Chair Catherine Lehman. Commissioners present at this briefing in addition to me, I hope will soon be Commissioner Degbele and we'll uh, announce when he's here. Uh, in the meantime, Commissioner Harriet, <coughs> Commissioner Kersenow, Commissioner Kladney, Commissioner Narasaki, and Commissioner Yaki are present. Vice Chair Timmons Goodson joins us by phone. Vice Chair, can you confirm that you're on the line? And if you are confirmed. I am on the line. Thank you, terrific. Yes. Um, a quorum of the commissioners is present. Is the court reporter present? Could you confirm? Yes. And is the staff director present? I am present. Thank you. So I welcome everyone to our public briefing titled Collateral Consequences, The Crossroads of Punishment, Redemption, and the Effects on communities. Today's briefing addresses what have been proliferating collateral consequences of incarceration, ranging from limitations on access to employment, the right to vote, subsistence aid for food and housing, and federal financial aid for education attainment, among many other categories. Our speaker's material, as well as the data for which Congress has funded collection, related to these collateral consequences show that in total, significantly more then 48,000 federal and state consequences could attach to criminal convictions. Itemized in labyrinthine federal and state codes and not always readily available to affected persons, including not only the persons accused of crimes, but also their attorneys, prosecutors, judges, and others. Happily, Senator Patrick Leahy championed the effort to include a survey of collateral consequences in the Court Security Improvement Act of 2007 and we have access to some collect collected information through the National Inventory of the Collateral Consequences of Conviction database that resulted from his effort. As I expect we will hear today, we have distance yet to travel to accurately capture the full range of collateral consequences, much less to ensure careful consideration of them as part of charging and sentencing decisions, as well as part of federal and state legislative decision making or more locally sound employment and other decisions. These issues do not only affect other people, and they do not only affect a defined subset of America. These issues affect all of us because they impact who can effectively be rehabilitated, who can transition from poverty to self-sufficiency, and who can access higher education degrees necessary to participate in a sustaining, thriving economy. These impacts touch public safety, economic health, and the full contours of our shared community. And they affect some of us painfully directly. To cite one statistic I learned from briefing materials for today, nearly half 
of all U.S. children have at least one parent who has a criminal record. The issues can also, not surprisingly, affect particular identity groups in ways that challenge or violate our core civil rights principles related to race, disability status, sex, including sexual orientation and gender identity. I expect we will hear today about all of those ways today's topic implicates civil rights. Because disability status can have particular resonance for collateral consequences absent reform, I highlight it for us to consider throughout our conversations today. DOJ statistics reflect that 45% of federal prisoners, 56% of state prisoners, and 64% of jail inmates have mental health diagnoses. For these populations in particular, collateral consequences, such as being barred from eligibility for public housing or food stamps, could preclude effective rehabilitation. If we do not take action, we will live those harms across our national community for generations forward. Today's briefing features 13 distinguished speakers who will provide us with an array of viewpoints, including multiple speakers who have themselves been incarcerated in the past. The first panel includes national experts who will provide an overview of the long-lasting effects of incarceration after a prison sentence ends. They will discuss how these continuing barriers impact recidivism and particular communities. The second panel includes national experts who will discuss the barriers to civic participation following incarceration, specifically focusing on the rights to vote and participate on a jury. The third panel also includes national experts who will discuss the barriers to self-sufficiency and meeting basic needs after incarceration, focusing on employment, housing, and access to public benefits. I look forward to hearing more from our experts who are gathered here today. And before we begin, I thank Commissioner Cladney at whose impetus the commission decided to take on this important issue. I also thank our staff who have put such hard work in today's briefing. I particularly recognize Sarah Lee Sewell, Merrick Xavier Breyer, LaShonda Brenson, and Maureen Rudolph for their efforts in putting together the panels and the research for today. I also thank Latrice Fauché, Pam Dunstan, Wanda Smith, Warren Orr, Michelle Yorkman Ramey, and Teresa Adams for their efforts in securing travel and all other logistical details for today. I hope to rem remember to make this announcement again before the close of the briefing, but for any other member of the public who would like to submit materials for our review, our public record remains open for 30 days following today's briefing, closing on Monday, June 20th. Materials can be submitted by mail to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights Office of General Counsel at 1331 Pennsylvania Avenue Northwest, Suite 1150, Washington, D.C., 20425, or by email to reentry at usccr.gov. During the briefing, our speakers and panelists will have seven minutes to speak, and I will hold you to that. Um, after each panel presentation, commissioners will have the opportunity to ask questions within our allotted period of time, and I will recognize the commissioners who wish to speak. I see that Commissioner Degbele has joined us. Thank you. In order to maximize the amount of opportunity for discussion between commissioners and panelists and to ensure that the afternoon panelists receive their fair share of time, I will strictly enforce our seven-minute time period for each panelist. Uh, panelists, you'll notice our system of lights uh, that we have set up. When the light turns from green to yellow, that means that two minutes remain. And when the light turns red, you should stop speaking. Um, my fellow commissioners and I will also keep our comments and questions concise, I hope. So our first panel, and the order in which they will speak, is as follows. Margaret Love, Executive Director of the Collateral Consequences Resource Center. Vikrant Reddy, Senior Research Fellow at the Charles Koch Institute. Tracy Birch, Associate Professor of Political Science at Northwestern University. John Malcolm, Vice President of the Institute for Constitutional Government at the Heritage Foundation. And a special commission point of privilege. John Malcolm also is a member of our DC State Advisory Committee to the US Commission on Civil Rights. And I very much appreciate your service in that way. And Naomi Goldberg, Policy and Research Director at the Movement Advancement Project. Ms. Love, please begin. I am very, very pleased to be here today and thank the Commission for uh, turning their attention to what I think is one of the most important policy issues uh, facing this country today. And it has really not had um, sufficient attention at the federal level, I believe. Um, my name is Margaret Love. I'm a lawyer in private practice here in Washington, and I specialize in federal executive clemency. Um, my involvement with collateral consequences goes back a number of years, uh, stemming from my service as U.S. pardon attorney in the Justice Department. Um, 
that's the, the office, I manage the office that makes recommendations to the president for pardons uh, or sentence commutations. <clears throat> Since leaving the Justice Department almost 20 years ago, I've represented people seeking relief from collateral consequences um, and have written law reviews and a couple of books on the adverse effects of a criminal record. Um, more recently, I founded the, um, the Collateral Consequences Resource Center, which um, serves as a kind of a focal point for policy and practice documents and research. Um, I want to just say a word since I'm the first witness to set the stage. Collateral consequences are nothing new. They have been around since Greek and Roman times. Um, when people were convicted of serious felonies, they were basically made outlaws. They were driven out of the community. They would frequently lose all of their property. Um, and even in our own country, um, civil death, the, the notion that, that you lost all rights before the law, continued well into the 20th century in many states. Um, the debased legal status that comes with a criminal conviction, particularly a felony conviction, um, allows almost any sort of civil penalty, and there are very few legal restrictions. Um, but collateral consequences have become a particular problem in the last 20 years um, for three reasons. There are more people affected by them. There are more laws and policies that restrict benefits and opportunities. And there are fewer ways to avoid or mitigate them. Um, many of these legal restrictions have very little nexus in a public policy, uh, a public safety, I should say, um, concern, um, and serve, as you mentioned, Madam Chair, uh, only to discourage reentry and rehabilitation. Um, they have become a pressing civil rights issue in so far as the criminal justice system itself has a disproportionate effect on racial and ethnic minorities. Um, they become what Michelle Alexander has famously called the new Jim Crow. Um, people are fond of citing the 48,000 laws and rules collected in the national inventory of which I was the first director, I must say. Um, uh, but for me, the more important, uh, that eye-popping number sort of obscures what I think is a equally important issue, and that is the serious problem of informal collateral consequences that are facilitated through easy access to criminal records and the increasingly prevalent practice of background checking. Uh, the law provides few protections against discrimination based on criminal record, which is more than simply a proxy for racial discrimination. Um, 20 years ago, background checks were rare, even for employment. Nowadays, they control access to almost er any area of endeavor, from in obtaining a home improvement loan to volunteering to coach your own kid's sports team. Uh, believe me, I know there are many stories that I get from my clients. And my clients, frankly, are an interesting subset insofar as many of them are established business people. They are not people who are just re-entering the community. They are people who have made it out. They are making a living. Uh, thank goodness so that I can make a living. Um, but they are still burdened with these disabilities and discrimination. Um, so I won't go into the, the technical advances that have made it possible to check a criminal record while you're sitting home on your sofa uh, instead of having to go to the courthouse and actually look it up. Uh, it is incredibly easy to check someone's criminal record. It is also incredibly unreliable. Uh, and name check, background checks can yield very unreliable results. Um, Unfortunately, in America, unlike other parts of the Western world particularly, there is no right to be forgotten. Um, I just want to mention three areas in which I think the Commission could have a really helpful um, contribution to this particular area. Um, one is in research, the second is in standard setting, and the third is in public education. Um, as to research, 
um, it is pretty clear that access to jobs and housing are the clearest predictor of future criminality. Um, it's also clear that employers and landlords are largely free to discriminate, notwithstanding some laws that have been extended to them. Um, but it's not clear what effect criminal records have on initial hiring and promotion or on job performance. Um, recent research, for example, in, indicates that the new ban the box rules and policies um, may have a questionable effect on hiring. It's not clear. Um, there are studies that, that show um, that it may, they may in fact result in fewer minorities being hired because of assumptions that are made. It's an unfortunate and unhappy circumstance, but that is what some of the recent research shows. But it's not clear what works. Let's put it that way. Um, the underlying issues that it, are that employers are simply reluctant to hire someone with a criminal record. And it is more than simply a public safety concern that they have. Um, witness my own clients um, uh, situation where they are barred from many opportunities where there really is no public safety issue at all. Um, the second issue thank is... Thank you so much, Ms. Lowe. Your time is up. But thank you very much. And, oh. And uh, we'll be able to enjoy time and questions. Sure. Thanks. Sure. Absolutely. Mr. Reddy. Well, hello. My name is Vikrant Reddy, and uh, it's a great honor to be in front of you today. I've testified in front of this body before, and I've uh, had the privilege of serving on the State Advisory Committee for my home state of Texas. So I've really appreciated the relationship that I've developed with this commission and admire the work that you do. Uh, I'm going to start my comments out today by saying something I think is not said nearly enough in the criminal justice circles that I've been working in for 10 years, and that is that accountability matters. Offenders have to be held accountable. Now, having said that, at a certain point, the accountability portion ends, and you have to help people re-enter society. You have to do this for two reasons. The first is the obvious moral reason, but the second reason is really a hard-nosed question of public safety. More than 90% of the people who enter state prisons in this country will come out of those prisons, and they will live next door to you and me. And we all have an interest in making sure that they are successfully reintegrated so that they are not hurting people again. I'm going to focus my comments today on the, uh, the key factor in uh, limiting recidivism, and that's employment. And I'm going to talk about some really prominent employment barriers that I think the Commission should take a look at. First of all, I'm going to talk about occupational licensing. Secondly, I'm going to talk about uh, driver's license suspensions. And then third, very briefly, I'm going to touch a bit on uh, ban the box, as Ms. Love uh, discussed, because I think that's worth digging into a little bit more uh, in, the, in the hearing today. First of all, on the question of occupational licensing, all of you are familiar with what occupational licensing is. These are rules that prohibit entry into a profession unless you've passed certain exams, you've got certain uh, standards that you've met. The easiest um, occupational licensing barrier in the world to announce is simply to say that someone is not permitted in the profession if they have a criminal record. This is something for which uh, people in the public and policymakers and government will immediately nod their head and say, well, yeah, that makes sense. But uh, unfortunately, those kinds of, that kind of logic has, uh, has piled up and led to a place where we have so many barriers that of this uh, 40,000 um, uh, figure that you've mentioned from the ABA that Ms. Love mentioned, the majority of those are actually licensing and certification barriers. It's extraordinary how many professions it's difficult to get into if you've got some kind of a criminal record. Some of these are, the way this works, uh, sometimes very obvious. People, you know, the law will simply say, uh, if you have this kind of a record, you can't get into this profession. But sometimes it's a little more insidious. They will have these good character requirements. And panels from within the profession will get together and assess whether or not you have the character to permit you into that profession. And of course, these panels are composed of people who have an economic interest in limiting competition in their profession. And they will uh, look at your criminal background. Sometimes they look at very unusual things. Before we changed a law in Texas in 2013, one thing that these committees would look at is your Class C misdemeanors. These are citations that are written by police officers. These are not things that people almost ever 
go to prison or even jail for. And yet these were the kinds of things that were being factored into uh, assessments of whether or not you have the moral character to enter a profession. Those are the kinds of things that uh, I think we really want to reconsider at the uh, policy level. I want to note uh, especially a really interesting paper that was done by a professor at Arizona State University. His name is Steven Solvinsky, and he did something really fascinating. He took a 10-year period from 1997 to 2007, and, uh, and he asked himself, what happens to recidivism rates in different states depending on how burdensome the occupational licensing requirements are? So the states in which the, and by the way, I should note that he took uh, uh, his figures on which states were most burdensome from the Institute for Justice, which has really the best research in this area. The states that have the most burdensome occupational licensing requirements during this 10-year period saw a 9% increase in recidivism rates. The states that had the least burdensome requirements saw a 2.5% decrease in recidivism rates. Now, uh, you know, correlation is not causation and all of those kinds of things are important to note, but I think it is a reasonable inference for policymakers to say that it's possible that this has something to do with whether or not people can be successful upon re-entry. At a certain point, economic desperation kicks in and you can imagine that people start committing crimes again. Let me also talk a bit about driver's licenses. I think that this uh, perhaps isn't fully appreciated in places where the policy wonk community resides, places like Washington or New York, because um, if you lose a driver's license in a place where you have a really great public transportation system, it's a nuisance, but it's not a catastrophe. But in most of America, if you lose a driver's license, it's a real catastrophe. It is impossible to get from point A to point B, and that means it's absolutely impossible to get to work. Uh, there may be certain reasons why you'd want to deny a driver's license to somebody because of a criminal action, but what we have done all too frequently is deny driver's licenses uh, to people because of underlying crimes that have nothing to do with the operation of motor vehicles. Uh, in the state of Virginia, for example, in the year 2015, 39,000 people were denied driver's licenses or had their driver's licenses suspended, excuse me. 99% of the underlying offenses had nothing to do with the operation of motor vehicles. Uh, it's important to note, I think, that these uh, sorts of licensing barriers, occupational licenses and driver's licenses, they come down much harder on uh, minority communities, disadvantaged communities, because those communities are uh, disproportionately represented in the criminal justice system. It's just sort of inevitable. that This is a way in which government policies, which are well-intentioned, uh, instead have this very counterproductive effect and have a counterproductive effect on the most vulnerable communities also. Very quickly on ban the box, um, what Ms. Love was saying is absolutely correct. There are these really interesting studies emerging that suggest that um, what people are doing whenever governments mandate they cannot look at criminal background is not simply shrug their shoulders and say, okay, I don't care anymore. Instead, they say, well, if you tell me I can't do it and I still care about criminal background, I'm going to find a proxy by looking at your resume to determine whether or not I think you've ever been incarcerated. And they use very crude stereotypes to try and figure out whether or not this is an African-American name, for example. And what may be happening uh, is that lower numbers of minorities are being interviewed for these positions in the first place. I know my time is up, so I will simply say that uh, the, my most prominent board member is Charles Koch himself. At his business in Kansas, they've implemented Ban the Box, but not under government mandate. It was something that they chose to do they've created a culture internally, and that I think would work better than a government mandate. Thank, thank you. you very much, Mr. Reddy. Professor Birch? Uh, thank you all. Uh, thank you to the commission. I'm gonna interrupt you just for a moment, just ask Mr. Reddy and Ms. Love to turn your microphones off so that our microphones will all still work. Thanks. Uh, is mine? Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this very important briefing, and thank you to the commission for uh, uh, undertaking this uh, important topic. In my written statement, um, I provided more detailed information uh, in response to the question about um, the extent to which these barriers uh, of collateral consequences affect an individual ex-offender's ability to um, re-enter society and to do that uh, with, res with respect to racial discrimination. However, I do just want to point out that I did provide a very brief 
uh, table that at least breaks down some of these uh, collateral consequences, the 48,000 number that people have been throwing around uh, by category so that we can see, um, and this table is taken from uh, Joshua Kaiser's work, uh, the paper is cited below, and this is table one um, from him. And as you can see here, as Kaiser estimates, about 62% of the post-release collateral consequences uh, affect employment and business licensing. Um, even, But there are also several other categories up here that I'm sure we will explore uh, throughout the day. I would just like to um, now pivot for the remainder of my time very briefly to talk about uh, racial and ethnic minorities uh, who are disproportionately affected by these collateral consequences, particularly African-Americans, because um, African-American men and women are disproportionately affected by the exponential expansion of the criminal justice system since the 1970s. Uh, black people are 13% of the US population, but are overrepresented among people who are arrested for crimes uh, and also who are incarcerated. About half of black men and about 40% of white men can expect to be arrested for anything by age 23. And almost half of black men can expect to be arrested for a felony in their lifetimes, compared with only 14% of white men. Blacks make up 37% of inmates incarcerated in local jails and 36% of state and federal prisoners. And so the racially disparate impact of criminal justice involvement does translate into racial differences in the effects of collateral consequences. And much of this transfer is really just how disparate impact works. Um, however, it arises such that disparate impact in one realm can lead to disparate impact in another. However, uh, this racially disparate impact of collateral consequences, I would argue, and the research shows is also exacerbated by racial discrimination. So I'll just talk about three uh, areas here. So with respect to employment discrimination, it is no secret that employers want to and prefer to hire individuals who do not have criminal records. However, uh, as Diva Pager and Lincoln Quillian show, and that paper is cited in my written remarks, using audit studies, they find that employers who are, are less likely to call back black job seekers generally and they're also less likely to call back job seekers of all race who admit to having criminal convictions. However, they also find that the effect of criminal convictions is 40% greater for blacks than whites, such that employers Hello. Hello. Uh, we're still on, but we're just having some microphone trouble. Okay, just checking, make Thank sure you. I wasn't cut off. Thank you, Vice Chair. Great, we're back, and I will give you your seconds back. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, so I think the, the point that I was just making there is that um, collateral consequences matter uh, in, with respect to employment for everyone, but employers are much more likely to penalize blacks and penalize bl uh, blacks with criminal conv convictions harshly uh, when making employment decisions relative to whites. Moreover, uh, because blacks are more likely to have contact with the criminal justice system, uh, they are more likely to be in these uh, databases uh, more so than whites. Um, and that may be the result of bad behavior, but numerous studies also suggest that racial discrimination may play a large role with respect to disparate criminal justice contact. Uh, so for instance, a collateral consequence of making criminal records widely available is that when you're putting in people just uh, into databases uh, just because they were either arrested or um, convicted of a minor uh, lower level offense, that practice, which in many cases has been shown to be discriminatory, just think about um, New York's uh, stop and frisk policy, 
that transfers the discrimination that blacks may face in the criminal justice system to the labor market, making it less likely that blacks will be hired for jobs. Briefly, with respect to government benefits, uh, racial disparities in punishment, particularly for drug, drug crimes, are widely known. Um, the difference in penalties between crack and powder cocaine still exists, um, even though it has been reduced, but also uh, more troubling blacks are more likely to be prosecuted and convicted of federal drug crimes, even though the usage rates in the population do not differ dramatically. Um, Many federal statutes do allow states to deny benefits such as TANF and public housing to people who are convicted of drug crimes. And many states are now also proposing drug tests for applicants for benefits. Uh, and so punishing drug addicts by denying them poverty relief. According to the National Council of State Legislatures, at least 15 states have passed laws involving drug testing for public benefits. So again, these issues with respect to uh, racial disparities in, in uh, convictions for drug crimes will then translate into racial disparities in the denial of public benefits. Finally, I just want to talk about a very um, interesting consequence that I don't think is reflected in the database, but is emerging in research, and that is uh, the notion of D DNA and private right, privacy rights. The collection of biological material um, through contact with the criminal justice system um, like fingerprints, but increasingly DNA profiles, is um, growing. And the National DNA um, Index System uh, is, is, growing, is, is growing as well with uh, millions of, of samples now. And as I noted in my written statement, Blacks are more likely to have records uh, in this database and in statewide DNA databases. Now, estimates vary widely, uh, but some studies estimate that it's many as half of the DNA profiles in the National DNA Index System are from Blacks. Again, Blacks are 13% of the population. It is important to remember that you can end up in these databases in many states, not because of a conviction, but even just from mere contact or arrest uh, with the criminal justice system. And states are making um, arrest grounds for including biological information in these databases. So as a result, Krimsky and Simon Selly estimate that nearly 10% of Blacks may have DNA on file in a state database. And Dorothy Roberts, uh, are now at University of Pennsylvania, argues that this increased and racialized genetic surveillance poses a threat to minorities who are already targeted by the criminal justice system. Um, using, in, in some, in, to think about it very um, concretely, in if law enforcement is conducting an investigation and two offenders did the same thing, one black, one white, the law enforcement is much more likely to catch an offender who is uh, black because they can either identify them directly through being in the DNA database or through a familial match because blacks are much more likely to be in this database. So with that, I will stop uh, because I think my time is up. Thank Thanks you. very much, Ms. Birch. Mr. Malcolm. Vice Chair, we're, we're having some microphone issues. We'll be back in a sec. Is that, yeah. Thank you. Great. It's a pleasure to be with you here today. Uh, so when most people think about the consequences of criminal conviction, they think about somebody being sentenced to prison or, or probation and, and maybe given a fine and restitution. Most people also probably think that once somebody is released from prison or their probationary period ends, that the punishment is over and the individual can begin the process of reintegrating into society and becoming a law-abiding citizen. But as you have heard, that is far from true. Uh, there are more than 48,000 federal and state civil laws and regulations that are referred to as collateral consequences that restrict the activities of ex-offenders and curtail their liberties uh, after they have been released from confinement or their probationary period has ended. And in fact, experts estimate that there are thousands of more similar restrictions at the local uh, in terms of local ordinances. So in 1910, in Weems versus United States, Supreme Court Justice Joseph McKenna described what really, you know, what awaits a criminal convict at the end of a sentence. And he stated, his prison bars and chains are removed, it is true, but he is subject to tormenting regulations that if not so tangible as prison bars and stone walls, oppress as much by their continuity and deprive of essential liberty. He was right. 
Uh, Ex-offenders face long uh, odds when they are trying to put their past behind them. In addition to the stigma that's associated with being an ex-offender, a lot of them have substance abuse issues, limited education, and even more limited job skills and experience. Now, regrettably, many of these ex-offenders will end up committing uh, additional offenses after their release. And although many of these individuals undoubtedly would have committed offenses regardless of whether any collateral consequences were imposed upon them, certainly a si significant minority, if not an outright majority, of ex-offenders would like to turn over a new leaf and become productive, uh, self-reliant, law-abiding members of society who are capable of supporting themselves and their families and helping in their community. As the American Bar Association has pointed out, however, if promulgated and administered indiscriminately, a regime of collateral consequences may frustrate the chance of successful reentry into the community and thereby encourage recidivism. Legislators have very broad discretion when it comes to enacting laws creating collateral consequences, and they're usually imposed under the guise of protecting public safety. These laws are considered to be remedial in nature and not punitive. They can affect, as you've already heard, among other things, an ex-offender's ability to get a job or a professional license, to get a driver's license, to obtain housing, student aid, or other public benefits, to vote, hold public office, or serve on a jury, even to do volunteer work and certainly to possess a firearm. Now, clearly there will be times when the public safety benefits will outweigh any burden that a particular collateral consequence imposes on an ex-offender. For example, it's perfectly reasonable pro to prohibit a convicted child molester from running a daycare center or residing near an elementary school. Prohibiting violent felons from purchasing or possessing firearms would be another example. Similarly, prohibiting somebody who's convicted of defrauding a federal program from participating in a related industry, at least for a period of time, is a sensible restriction that is directly related to the substance of the offense that was committed. Other collateral consequences, however, have at best a tenuous connection to public safety and appear to be more punitive in nature. Now, imposing punitive restrictions on ex-offenders out of a continuing sense of anger comes at a very high cost. It makes it far more difficult for an ex-offender to reintegrate into society. So Ohio law, for example, provides for the suspension or revocation of an offender's driver's license upon a conviction for some crimes that are entirely unrelated to driving. And as my friend Vikrant said, you know, why would you restrict an ex-offender's ability to get to a job or to pick up your children or to go to school if that individual poses no greater danger on the road than any other driver? A criminal conviction can cost a military veteran his or her pension, insurance, and a right to medical treatment, which is particularly troubling given the fact that some studies indicate that veterans who are suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder and therefore in serious need of medical treatment may be far more likely to commit crimes. So as you've heard, about 60 to 70 percent of these more than 48,000 collateral consequences are employment related. And as Vikrant also said, there are even more when you uh, add to it a good moral character qualification uh, for job uh, and professional license requirements. These laws include ex prohibiting ex-offenders from operating a dance hall, a bar, a pool hall, a bowling alley, or a movie theater, or from working as a midwife, an interior designer, a barber, a contractor, an HVAC installer or repairman, or a cab driver. Even creative politicians would be hard pressed to come up with legitimate public safety rationale for prohibiting ex-offenders from engaging in these professions. This is particularly absurd when one considers that many ex-offenders receive training to become barbers or HVAC installers and repairmans while they're incarcerated, only to discover that they can't get a license to practice the one field in which they now have a marketable skill. There are tens of millions of ex-offenders living in our communities, and millions more will be joining them in the next few years. It is important that we do everything we can to encourage them to become productive, law-abiding members of society, and that we not put too many impediments in the form of excessive collateral consequences in their way that will hinder their efforts. It is not in anyone's interest to consign ex-offenders to permanent second-class status. Doing so will only lead to wasted lives, ruined families, and more crimes. And I'm hoping in a time of intense polarization that this is one issue that people can rally around and find some common ground. Thank you for inviting me to appear before you today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Malcolm. Ms. Goldberg. 
We may have to move the microphone over for you. Thank you for your flexibility. Good morning. My name is Naomi Goldberg, and I'm the Director of Research and Policy for the Movement Advancement Project. I'd like to thank the commissioners and your staff for extending the opportunity to share how the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender LGBT community um, is disproportionately and uniquely impacted by the criminal justice system. The Movement Advancement Project is a think tank focused on speeding equality for LGBT people in the United States. In 2016, we released a series of reports along with the Center for American Progress focused on the experiences of LGBT people with the criminal justice system. We focused on all aspects of the criminal justice system, ranging from engagement with law enforcement and the societal forces that push LGBT people into the system, to the experiences in the legal system and the harsh violence and um, harassment that LGBT people experience in prisons and jails, and finally, to the unique challenges that LGBT people face when trying to rebuild their lives um, with a criminal record. Rather than walk you through the entirety of our report, I'm going to take, focus my remarks on two topics that bear important relevance to your work today. First, emerging research shows that LGBT people, particularly LGBT people of color, are disproportionately incarcerated. The second thing I'd like to focus on is the unique challenges that these LGBT people face with, when they have a criminal record upon reentry. So first, research finds LGBT people are overrepresented in America's prisons and jails. And I have a slide here um, that shows that in general, about 4% of the US population um, identifies as LGBT. Yet when you look at currently incarcerated people, you see much higher rates. So in the 2011, 2010, 2012 National Inmate Survey, a national probability sample, um, there were more than one quarter of women in jails identify as lesbian, gay, or bisexual, as do one in three women in America's prisons. The numbers are slightly lower for men, as you see on the right. Um, on the second slide, you can see the same rates for LGBT youth held in juvenile detention facilities. So here in the 2012 National Survey of Youth in Custody, another nationally representative sample of youth in juvenile correction facilities, nearly 40% of girls um, in juvenile correction facilities identify as lesbian, gay, or bisexual. This compares to national estimates about 7 to 9% of all youth who identify as LGBT. This demonstrates a greatly increased overrepresentation of LGBT youth in the, in the juvenile justice system. And another survey found that of LGBT youth in the system, 85% are youth of color. So I think these numbers really challenge us to think about who are in our prisons and jails um, and to think about what their unique needs are when they're released. So the issues that face LGBT people in the general population, ranging from family rejection, employment discrimination, bullying and harassment in schools, and police targeting, can be even more pronounced when someone is released from prison or has a criminal record. LGBT people can have a uniquely hard time rebuilding their lives because of added roadblocks in three key areas shown on this slide. First, inadequate reentry programs and restrictive probation and parole policies. Second, this discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity that's pervasive both in those programs and in society more broadly. And finally, the collateral consequences that everyone on this panel has been speaking about and that you all be working on all day today. So taking the first piece, there's a general lack of support for LGBT people in probation, parole, and reentry programs. So reentry planning includes helping inmates try to find employment and housing upon being released. Um, for transgender inmates, for example, um, it can be very difficult, if not impossible, to obtain identity documents that accurately reflect their gender identity. The reason is that many transgender people are housed in correctional facilities that do not reflect their gender identity. As a result, staff may be simply unaware of how to obtain an accurate identity document for these people. Without an accurate driver's license with a gender marker and name that match their identities, transgender people who are released from prison face added challenges in finding jobs and accessing the very services they need. Additionally, there's been cases in which transgender people have been placed into halfway houses that do not match their gender identity and had been referred to by their legal names and not, um, and had their, even their clothing taken away from them. 
Some individuals on probation and parole are required to attend job training or educational programs or to hold steady jobs as a condition of their parole. Again, LGBT people face high rates of discrimination, in, particularly in employment. In a 2016 nationally representative survey conducted by the Center for American Progress, fully one quarter of LGBT people experience discrimination because of their sexual orientation or gender identity in the last year. These are not formally incarcerated, this is the entire population. With half of those people saying that it, it happened in the work environment. Obviously with a criminal record, LGBT people have an even harder, harder time finding jobs. Second, LGBT people, particularly those with a criminal record, record, face added discrimination that can make rebuilding their lives more difficult. As I just mentioned, LGBT people face generally high rates of employment discrimination in housing and public accommodations, all made worse by the fact that there's no federal law explicitly prohibiting such discrimination. And fewer than half states, half of states have protections for LGBT people. This discrimination compounded by discrimination experienced by those with a criminal record along the range rate along the lines of race and sex can make it even more difficult for LGBT people to find the two building blocks of successful reentry, as everyone has mentioned, employment, but also housing. Finally, the disenfranchisement, discrimination, and broader challenges that face individuals with a criminal record obviously also impact LGBT people with criminal records. Fixing America's criminal justice system means fixing it for everyone, including the nine million LGBT people living across this country. I have two broad recommendations. First, non-discrimination provisions should be included in all government-funded reentry programs. Federal, state, and local governments should require all organizations receiving government funding for reentry to include non-discrimination provisions that explicitly address race, sex, sexual orientation, and gender identity. Second, prison and jail reentry programs should provide a holistic assessment of individuals' needs. Probation and parole officers and staff in prisons and reentry facilities need to include these crucial components for LGBT people. Access to safe, affordable housing, competent, affordable health care, educational resources, employment, and more. Program staff should receive training and be aware of the added barriers LGBT people face in accessing these jobs, these programs and services. Federal and state, local, prisons and jails and detention facilities should make supplementary resources available to LGBT people as part of release planning. I would like to thank the commissioners and their staff for allowing me to participate in today's hearing and lifting up the experiences of LGBT people in the United States as they're disproportionately impacted by the criminal justice system. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ms. Goldberg, and thank you to all the panelists. Before we start with questions, I, we're going to just take a short break so that we can switch out the one mic that's not working and then we don't have to keep <laughs> moving the mic. So uh, we'll take a pause and sorry about that. While we're taking that break anyway, I also will apologize to you. I'm recovering from illness, so I'm going to uh, keep coughing during the day, but it's not a reflection on you. <laughs> you all can be especially sad. <laughs> I am very sad. I am not contagious, I promise. <laughs> I checked. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Thank you all for your presentations, and I uh, will open it up to my fellow commissioners for questions, in particular, Vice Chair, because uh, you're not present. Please uh, either email me or uh, speak loudly <laughs> so that we can make sure we call on you. Commissioner Carsonell. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks very much to the panel. This is very, um, very informative and very instructive. Thanks also to staff. Um, we've been talking a lot about laws that do not have a rational basis or are not rationally related to the ostensible objectives that are at least uh, stated whenever uh, legislatures uh, implement laws related to uh, felons and reentry into different fields. But I'm wondering if there's any data that shows, even if 
and I know this is difficult to show because it, it, it would rely on certain presumptions. Uh, if you were to remove uh, occupational, professional, business licensing laws, laws that present barriers to entry for uh, ex-felons, um, to what extent would there still be market barriers to this extent? Even if you were to remove laws and regulations related to professional licensing um, or occupations, you would still have insurance companies, for example, that would probably raise insurance premiums for whatever businesses were employing those individuals or whatever businesses that ex-felons, for example, established their, on their own. Does anybody have any data or any understanding as to, to what extent those would still provide or, or, or present barriers to those who've been incarcerated? Well, so Vikrant Reddy referred to some studies that are also referred to in my, my written work about, um, my written testimony, about states that have removed more of these barriers end up having higher employment rates among uh, ex-offenders and lower recidivism rates. But of course, you're absolutely correct. They're going to continue to be market barriers. I mean, even if you have a voluntary or, for that matter, a compulsory ban the box uh, provision, at some point at the end of the hiring process, you get to ask somebody whether they have a criminal conviction. And there'll be people who will just not want to employ formerly incarcerated people, either because of excessive insurance rates or they fear a lawsuit if something happens or a PR hit. Uh, if it doesn't work out or it comes out that they are employing uh, somebody who is uh, an ex-offender. There are some companies like the Charles Koch industry and others uh, that have said, you know, we're going to set that aside or we're going to ask a lot of questions and try to employ the most talented people. Uh, but those barriers will certainly remain, but the studies that do exist indicate that when you at least remove this barrier, that more ex-offenders get employed uh, and there are fewer recidivism rates. Um, I'd like to add something to that. Um, I think the one really important thing to focus on is this problem of no standards, this kind of uh, uh, blanket uh, categorical bar on people with a criminal record. I think your mention of the insurance industry is tremendously important. I can't tell you how frequently I've been told that my company cannot hire people with a record because our insurance will not allow it. I think the absence of standards. This, this sort of uh, granular case by case. What are the standards? Many state laws have standards. How long has it been since you were convicted? What were you convicted of? What have you done since? If the, if the concern is public safety in a general, in, in, in a real way, having standards, this is one place that I think this commission could really be helpful, developing standards that will help people, particularly people who want to do the right thing understand how do we measure the risk. So, so I think that's tremendously important. And I think the, the area of insurance that you just mentioned, insurance companies have got to be uh, uh, regulated to a certain extent. They can't put these barriers uh, in the way of willing em employers. So I could just uh, follow up on that real quickly. Um, and it strikes me insurance companies obviously have a proprietary interest in getting the risk assessment right. Is there evidence that they're not getting the risk assessment right? For me, only anecdotal that I have been told that they simply have blanket policies, no one with a criminal record, no matter what it was or how long ago it was. Now, that's, again, it's anecdotal, but I suspect that there may be ways of finding out um, whatever the industry is that regulates insurance providers might well be able to find out. Mr. I, I did. <laughs> that may not stretch. Here we go. Well, I um, I agree with everything that that both John and Margaret said. I don't have a good answer to the insurance question, but I have an anecdote that I think you'd find really interesting. I used to work in uh, Texas state politics at a think tank, and I was working on criminal justice issues, and we would hear from a number of employers that, for personal reasons, they were actually very interested in hiring ex-offenders. They had 
uh, you know, like family reasons or whatever, you know, that they had some sympathy for people in this position. But they would tell us, just as Margaret said, nevertheless, we can't do this because uh, the insurance costs would be far too high and we just can't take on that kind of a risk. We started sharing these anecdotes with uh, state office holders in Texas and many of them said to us, well, that sounds like a tort reform problem. That's something that Texas has worked on in the past, and we could do something on that issue here. And so in the year 2015, Texas actually um, passed damage caps on these negligent hiring lawsuits. And uh, it's far too recent for me to have any data for you on exactly what the results have been. But this is something that has been um, tried. And what I think was particularly interesting about it was that it was tried in, in a red state with a conservative political culture and the arguments used to justify doing this were conservative political arguments. I think it's an interesting idea that other states could take a look at. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I'd uh, point out uh, to everyone, actually, that the commission uh, several years ago at the behest of uh, Commissioner Kurzenau uh, did a uh, employment uh, ban the box uh, briefing. And uh, what we did find out was uh, interesting uh, information that uh, our briefing showed that like a white person with a felony was more likely to be employed than a black person uh, without a felony. Uh, that many employers would not even use official uh, ways to find out if someone had a record or check whether that uh, background check was correct. Uh, and many employers would use the internet, which is uh, failingly uh, lacks credibility, I guess. Uh, and that uh, they had to consider the job, the offense, and the time. So we, we actually, in that report, I think, came up with some uh, conclusions as to uh, how how people should handle that, how employers should handle it. Uh, but uh, regretfully, uh, we can't make the law. So do you propose state-by-state uh, -state laws or, or federal laws? And my second question to the panel is, uh, when it comes to uh, licensing and occupation in my state, many, many of the licensing boards uh, have, uh, it's not a waiver permission, it's a pro uh, provision, it's a, it's a permission <laughs> Uh, type of uh, uh, application uh, rather than a bar. Uh, so how do you propose licensing boards actually handle uh, licensure of people who not just have been in prison but who have uh, criminal convictions? Uh, and actually it's not even just felonies, it's also misdemeanors. Um, what most states do um, is they have a system by which people may regain their rights and regain a sense of good character. Um, every state has a way, whether it's through um, judicial certificates, executive pardon, uh, sealing or expungement, a variety of relief mechanisms. These can be very useful if they're particularly, if they're linked to protections against negligent hiring. And there are some very interesting new national law reform proposals. One next week, the American Law Institute is going to be approving, uh, along with their model penal code on sentencing, a whole system of how to deal with collateral consequences that includes a negligent hiring protection, which ought to address the, the insurance problem. Again, I, I think it's very important to, to do away with these mandatory bars and develop standards that can help licensing boards, that can help employers arrive at the right decision and to provide specific official designation of rehabilitation that a pardon, for example, would. Um, so that's, that's what I think is the most important thing. Well, isn't that a really complex kind of uh position to put an offender in who may not be well educated or have the money to apply or hire someone like yourself? Well, that's for sure. And increasingly, legal aid providers and public defenders are realizing that collateral consequences are very much a part of their job. Um, and that people who, who are having trouble dealing with having an old criminal record, whether it's through expungement or some sort of judicial certificate, they can get help in many states from legal aid offices. 
And I think giving resources and encouragement to legal aid and public defender offices to regard this as part of their job, and in fact, to encourage prosecutors to also consider this as a part of their job, that these are success stories. They should want success stories out of the people that they prosecute. So I think getting a systemic buy-in from all the players in the system, including courts, and certainly licensing boards, to address this problem at a rational level, I think it's really important. And then is there anybody who would like to contribute as to how licensing boards should operate uh, in the initial application stage or uh, that type of thing. Is there some, do uh, you all propose some sort of standard approach that would be a model uh, for uh, jurisdictions to use? I, I'm not sure about a standard approach. So this is part of a bigger, a bigger problem that it goes beyond this, but is included, encompassed within this, uh, which is a lot of state licensing boards are also made up of, of people who are in that profession who are frankly rent seekers and are trying to keep out competition. And, and people who are ex-offenders, they're the low-hanging fruit in terms of keeping out competition. Just come up with a blanket rule and you're eliminating a whole slew of areas. So one thing I think that has to happen is that state, state legislators uh, ought to be paying more attention to avoiding rent seeking with professional licensing boards. And the other they ought to do is, as I said, there are a whole slew of professions in which it is, it, it would plumb the depths of my imagination to come up with a legitimate public safety reason why an ex offender could not be an interior decorator, particularly in, in, in days of Yelp, in which people can post bad reviews if an ex offender is a bad interior decorator. And so I think that they need to be far more scrutinizing in terms of looking at categories and coming up with you know, scalpel-like approaches to eliminating people from professional licenses and jobs uh, than the meat cleaver that is usually employed by people who have a vested interest in keeping out competition. Yeah, I, I agree with Mr. Malcolm. I, I think that um, some of these licensing boards probably just need to be eliminated altogether. They don't really make a lot of sense. And the criminal justice benefits would be incidental, but you'd have these really broad economic benefits, more competition, lower prices, more innovation. Um, you know, in, in Louisiana, I think this is still the case, you have to pass a written exam to become a florist. And one of the arguments that was made was that, well, roses and other flowers have thorns. You could prick yourself. There's blood. I mean, there's all sorts of safety issues involved. And these are just really absurd arguments. But as John said, the low-hanging fruit here is to say, well, anybody with some kind of a criminal record can't be permitted in our profession. And uh, you'll see people immediately nod their heads in support of that. I think that uh, as John said, if you just look more broadly at the economic benefits of reducing licensing in society, the criminal justice issues that we're talking about here would be uh, incidentally benefited. Let me just add one thing. Most states, two-thirds of the states, do already have laws that set standards for licensing. We've collected all those laws on our website. And, and so if those laws were observed and enforced, uh, I think a good deal of this problem would go away. Just one more question. Ms. Birch, you spoke about a DNA uh, database, and I, I made some notes, but I'm trying to figure yes. out what is the problem, what is the solution, is there a solution, is there a problem? So the issue that I raised is uh, the collection of DNA for um, even incidental contact, even before conviction, leads to a disproportionate um, representation of blacks relative to other groups uh, in, in, in the um, database. The, uh, a couple of issues, um, I think, are that one, privacy, um, having your DNA on file forever. In um, many cases, people don't realize that that's what's, what's happening, um, can come back late, uh, to be problematic later in several instances. Um, one, for instance, is that people are starting to, um, uh, as Dorothy Roberts points out, use these uh, DNA databases to do, uh, to of course solve crimes, but even to use familial, familial DNA matching. So looking in the database to figure out 
if a crime scene matches even someone in a family to then narrow down the suspect pool. And the um, moral and other implications of that pr uh, procedure aside, again, it leads to the situation that blacks are more likely to be caught by law enforcement than whites because of their disproportionate presence in this database. And again, a lot of people in this database aren't even there because they've been convicted of crimes. Just contact, arrest or contact can get you into the database in certain states. Yeah. So in some, so to think about either um, changing the process or the point at which people, at, at a minimum, are where DNA is collected and how it's stored. If someone is put on trial, for instance, and then um, found innocent, does their DNA then get taken out of these databases legally? And is that policy actually implemented is one way to even just to start trying to solve this problem. Um, maybe not at the point of arrest, but at the point of conviction. Um, again, the, 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 real, the real issue is the disproportionate um, uh, arrest rates that may or may not be driven by crime uh, and actual commission of a crime versus um, then thinking about is DNA or fingerprints, other kinds of biological materials collected? If so, for how long? If the person is, again, not found guilty, is that um, information discarded or is it kept? And then going forward, how is it used? And I think we're still at the beginning of using DNA for um, solving of, for the solving of crimes, but also, again, uh, people may use these data for research into criminal um, criminal tendencies and the like, and that is, and so there is a danger that this these um, this disparity in being in the database is going to have detrimental effects, racially detrimental effects down the road. They also use it for the exoneration of people who wrongfully commit, uh, convicted, right? Right. Yes, of course. But it is important to think about. The pot, there is this positive benefit of exoneration, but there can also be a downside, as is the case with many um, public policies. Thank you. Commissioner Yaki. Uh, thank you very much. Um, what's interesting about this briefing is, I think as, as Ms. Love pointed out, this is uh, something that goes far back. I remember reading uh, back in high school about uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne and the Scarlet Letter. I mean, it's really no different now than it is then, uh, the desire to uh, shame, punish, and otherwise ostracize uh, people in communities for whatever crimes that may have been committed. And all of us, uh, as people of good conscience and goodwill, are always faced with the story of, well, could did this person turn their life around and should they be able to do something? And I think that's something that this hearing uh, is about. I had a couple of Quick questions for some of the individual panelists. Uh, Mr. Reddy, you mentioned that the Coke Industries had taken away the, the box. I just wanted to know what the experience has been with that, and any, have you done any studies, or have they done any studies, or seen any res results as a result of that? Uh, I can't give terribly detailed information. I work for the Charles Koch Institute, so this is Mr. Koch's uh, philanthropic endeavor, but um, Obviously, he has his company in Kansas, and from time to time, I meet executives uh, from that company. I've asked them. I've said, "Well, you know, you got rid of uh, of this question on the application. What kind of results have you seen?" And anecdotally, they tell me that things have gone really well. My sense of it is that when companies do this on their own, they they are required to really kind of go the extra mile. They have to bring in their HR people. They have to talk to them about why they have this vision, about why they want to do it this way, what their broader uh, social concerns are. I mean, there's a real education effort that has to happen within the employer. And so it's probably going to be a lot more effective if that happens rather than if you're simply informed that, look, uh, you're not allowed to ask this question anymore. Um, now, the problem with my answer there is that uh, it, it's really hard uh, for government to do anything um, 
you know, to just kind of create underlying cultural change within uh, employers. But if we can encourage more of that, that's actually going to get us the kinds of results that we want, uh, a lot more than I think the government mandates will, because um, as we've talked about today, and as apparently you've had a previous briefing on, some evidence is emerging that's suggesting that whenever these mandates are created, uh, the consequences are counterproductive. Um, another question, uh, going to the uh, panel, as I as I sort of understand, look at this and understand this, I'm trying to think of what is we have this intersection in terms of the disproportionate impact on minority communities, and then their ability to try and go through, even if they are aware of the different hurdles and procedures that that may exist, and has anyone seen any sort of Title VII litigation on this, or is it, or because of their status as a prisoner, does that sort of exempt them from the ability to file a claim of, of disproportionate impact of how these pro, of how these procedures for res restoration are being applied in the states? Um, I can speak to that. Um, three or four years ago, EEOC developed guidance on um, how the effect of a criminal record can raise a Title VII problem. There have been a handful of lawsuits um, challenging company policies that, that exclude people with a record or have a disparate impact on them. They are linked to racial or other bases that are prohibited, which is not that hard to do, actually. Um, but there are only a handful. And I think that it is very hard to try to affect social change through litigation, this kind of litigation. Um, I think I really want to associate myself with what you just said, uh, Vikram, it, because I think this there are more employers, people who I call the willing but worried, who, who would hire people with a record if they thought it was um, acceptable, safe, if they could avoid the risk, not simply of public safety, but of the kind of criticism in the community. I mean, I've heard, for example, FedEx and UPS are very reluctant to hire people with a record because they are worried about what people will think or be fearful of. And, and again, this, this is the problem of reassuring employers who are willing. And if you can, can sort of develop standards encourage states to have effective restoration procedures so that there's easy access to sort of uh, a rehabilitation certification, if you will. I, I would say through the courts is probably the best way to do it. This, this kind of a, a system of, of certifying rehabilitation and encouraging employers and giving them some sense of protection, I think that will go a long way to, to improving and finding more industries like the Coke industries. Um, one final thing. Uh, I used to, uh, when I was in law school, I would, I actually did a lot of work with uh, prisoners. We had a big prison project in, in Connecticut. And what obviously happened over the years is that the idea of rehabilitation has kind of been thrown out the window and we're into its punishment and then you're out. To what extent do you believe that a, a renewed commitment to uh, post-release programs, whether it's drug treatment, whether it's job training, is going to be helpful in sort of creating a, a better baseline for a lot of these individuals to overcome these, these hurdles that are out there? Um, I think there are two things. Number one, there are the uh, uh, re-entry programs, the service provision of people coming out of prison, for example. But you mentioned Connecticut, which, which is really kind of a, 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 a wonderful example of a state that's doing both a great deal of reentry programming. They also, however, have a very uh, uh, active and functional pardon system in Connecticut, where they process hundreds of applications. Um, and th there are also other kinds of relief mechanisms in Connecticut. That state could be a, a a real bellwether for how to handle this. Now, their pardon board is independent of the governor, so that gives it a certain degree of presumed functionality. But there are other kinds of systems. 
Indiana is a state also that has a more recent scheme for restoring rights. And I, I mean, there, there are a number of states that have been experimenting, and I wish the federal government would kind of take some steps in this direction Maybe also. Maybe we'll get Vice President Pence to say something about that. Yeah, yeah. Commissioner Yaki, you... He you, signed that law, by yeah, the way, exactly. after he'd been in office about three months. You touched on an important point, but you limited your, your question to post-release programs. And I think, while post-release programs certainly ought to be encouraged, what makes far more sense are, frankly, pre-release uh, programs. I mean, so people, when they're out, whatever demons uh, that they had going into prison, uh, if they are left untreated while they are in prison, are likely to continue. They're just more untreated problems that will continue. And and they're now going to face all kinds of pressures on the outside world, including having to get jobs and you know get back in, in terms of their connection with family members and probably some bad influences that were in their life beforehand. When you can really address these problems is when people are actually incarcerated. You have physical control over them. You can give them some kind of an incentive to actually take these programs and complete these programs at a time in which they will receive the benefits of those. And then once they are released, having completed these programs, they will be far less likely to recidivate. So there were all kinds of criminal justice proposals that were introduced uh, in Congress that addressed what is referred to as prison reform. I expect that those proposals will come up again. Uh, so while post-release programs are important, I don't wish to downplay those at all, I think pre-release programs may be even better and more effective. Well, and I just wanted to add to that briefly that I think we also have to think about what happens to people when they're in prison. It's not only what, what they come in with, you know, in the, in, for the LGBT community, for example, one in four trans people is sexually assaulted in prison. So what does that do then when you leave and you have that experience and it's not being addressed when you try to rebuild your life? And so I think, and that's just the LGBT example, but I think right, prisons in many ways are not places that help people grow. And you know, I think particularly when we think about young people and what that means for someone that they're incarcerated at 18 or 19. And I think there's some great examples in the youth context where there is so much more emphasis on rehabilitation and thinking about this as a chance to restart as opposed to a chance to be penalized for all the stuff that you came in with. And so I think that there are definitely opportunities there to get people fix up. And in the medical context, a lot of people are actually more adherent to drugs or to medications while they're in prison. And then when they're released, there's a lot of drop off. And so I think thinking about the while you're in prison, as well as outside and having that be a, a constant thread and have a lot of connection between those is super important. So I'm going to insert Adam myself Chair. out of order. Uh, uh, I will add you to the list, Vice Chair, <clears throat> and I'm going to insert myself out Thank of order because one of my questions is, is directly related to what you were just saying, Ms. Goldberg. You, you mentioned in your opening testimony that there's a general lack of support for reentry, in particular for LGBT inmates. Can you, I, I read your report, I heard your testimony. I, can you give us sites either now or, or following this for what you mean by that lack of support and, and what would be needed? So unfortunately, you know, there is very little data collection about LGBT people generally. Um, there's not, there are not questions on the census and so forth. And so much of what we have is really just about people who are currently incarcerated, which are the two nationally representative samples that I mentioned. So most of what we know about reentry experiences is anecdotal or has come through litigation. So for example, in Illinois, there was a woman who was released into a halfway house. Um, she's trans, she's put into a men's facility even though that is actually in contradiction to PREA and the requirements around placement. Um, and she reported, you know, just how can I possibly go get a job when I can't wear my own clothing or put on makeup or be myself? And so I think we need to understand much better what's happening. And there are some efforts, um, the National um, LGBT Task Force is undertaking a survey of reentry providers to understand competency? Have you ever thought about the needs of your LGBT clients, given that one in three women identify as lesbian, gay, or bisexual, when they are released, that is not unrelated to their re-entry experience. Um, and so I think there is a recognition within the, within the LGBT community that we need to understand this much better. Um, but I think also there needs to be more data collected about LGBT people's experiences um, in national surveys and so forth. Very helpful. Thank you. And if, and if it were possible just to share with us some of the litigation that you're referring to, yeah. that would also be helpful. Happy to. Thanks. All right. Commissioner Narasaki. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I have some different questions for uh, different of uh, all of you. So one of them is we weren't able to find very much on the issue of consequences for people who are trying to get loans or aid for school. And it seems to me that that is a critical 
part of trying to be able to get the job skills and credentials necessary uh, even once you are able to eliminate the licensing requirements. So uh, it would be very helpful to hear from those of you who may have expertise or thoughts about what is the current state uh, of uh, access, uh, uh, collateral consequences in the education system, and what do you think should be done about that if there are still problems? You mentioned two things. One is the issue of loans, and the other one is access to education. Those, those are governed by two sort of different um, systems of laws or rules or policies, if you will. Um, most of the uh, limits on bank loans are governed by private policies that are, uh, that are if not unique, they're particular to banks. Um, education is another matter. That is very frequently governed by law, and it's a state-by-state -state issue. Um, and I think it's tremendously important to ensure that people have access to education, particularly um, for uh, training and higher, higher education as well. New York State has taken some very progressive state uh, steps recently, um, and I'd be glad to to um, provide you with particulars about that. But, but I think that the whole banking area um, is tremendously important and it is not regulated and banks will not deal with people with a criminal record. They won't make them loans. In fact, some of my clients who are more successful and further away from their crime, they cannot have investment accounts with banks if they have a record that may be 20 or 25 years old. So banks are a real problem, and they're not well known. Even in the area of, uh, I was thinking more loans in the context of education, the guaranteed loans. Um, I'm not sure how the federal law mm -hmm. on student loans works as far mm -hmm. as people with a record. There used to be a, a stricter rule about students losing their, their federal loans if they, were, uh, if they had a past drug conviction. Uh, now they lose them if they have a conviction while they are in school um, with federal loans. Um, but I think that is that is not as big a problem as uh, having general access to financial support from banks. Although I will say that I think that while there was a change um, in the eligibility for student for federal student loans, I don't think that that was well communicated. And so I think the perception is if, you have a, if you're a youth, you have a record, a drug-related offense, you can't get a loan. Um, and I think the other piece is actually on the college front, that there are some colleges that do ask about criminal record for students who are enrolling. And we came up with a couple of examples in our research, particularly around youth who were convicted of sex offenses, whether they are dangerous or not, um, that colleges are very wary to let someone come to college who might have a sex offense, for example. And obviously that category we know is incredibly broad and frequently is, is not as is misused in many cases. So I think that those are two pieces that are really important is both education about the limits for federal loan applications and that you really can get student loans. And if you wait two years, you, you still can go to college, but also on the college front, I think much like the employers, this like willing and worried piece that colleges set up barriers for students um, that, that probably should be removed. And, and Mr. Malcolm, I'm very concerned about the issue of vets, veterans, right, of them losing their pensions or other benefits, uh, particularly given that there are are some who do come back with uh, PTSD or other issues and end up homeless. And if you're homeless and you end up, there are a myriad number of crimes you could be committing just because you're homeless. So could you talk about what the state of the law is and, and what's going on in terms of trying to help that population? Well, Ms. Love is probably better equipped to answer that question than I am. I do know that there are uh, some federal laws that deprive veterans of these benefits, including uh, their ability to seek treatment, uh, you know, when they are convicted of crimes. Uh, and obviously there are returning veterans, large numbers of them that are suffer from things like PTSD uh, and sometimes worse, uh, that are clearly contributing factors to, uh, to committing crimes. We may unfortunately have just witnessed this yesterday in Times Square uh, with the returning naval veteran. Uh, and I just think it is, it is 
self-defeating. I mean, if you have identified, I mean, that it's for this precise reason, for instance, that a number of states have, in quite innovative manner, set up specialty courts, including veterans courts, to address the unique issues that veterans face if they return, when they return, uh, and they develop these disorders that may be a contributing factor to committing crimes and to limit their access to treatment, people who have actually served our country uh, and face the prospect of death in order to protect our freedoms. I just think it's horrific. I'll just add a short note on that, that depending upon the nature of your discharge, whether it's a bad conduct discharge or even dishonorable, uh, you may lose uh, el eligibility for a variety of benefits ranging from your pension to the ability to be buried in a veteran's cemetery. But those are linked to, to the nature of your discharge uh, rather than to the commission of a crime. So it's something that's linked to your service as opposed to post something that might happen post-service. That's right. That's okay. right. That's very helpful. Um, and then I just had one more question uh, about, let me see if I can find it. Uh, yes, that's right. So, Ms. Goldberg, you had referred in your written testimony about the challenges in terms of potential loss of rights to adopt or uh, to lose your actual parental rights. Uh, of course, it was in the context of the LGBT community, which is particularly fraught, but I'm wondering if you could explain a little bit more about what those issues might be. So, specifically, I think more LGBT related, um, you know, many families need to do what's called a second parent adoption to establish legal ties between um, a child and a parent. Um, and in many instances, there is questions about a criminal record. And we scanned all of the LGBT legal organizations and no one had really heard of anybody being denied a second parent adoption. That said, we know that many low income communities don't do a second parent adoption because it's costly. And those may be the same communities where there may be criminal justice former involvement that could be challenging. Um, I think, you know, there's a long line of history of LGBT people losing parenting rights for all kinds of reasons related to their sexual orientation and gender identity. And I think knowing now that LGBT people are disproportionately incarcerated, we know that lots of people lose parental rights when they become incarcerated. And even if they don't lose those legal rights, there's disconnection that happens. And I think that particularly given the tenuous connections between LGBT parents and their children that for, frequently aren't legally tied being incarcerated could result in an entire family sort of fracturing. So that was where we were going with the second parent adoption piece. Again, we don't have examples, but given that that is a case by case and family courts and judges are making those decisions, I think that is an, a place where there could be a lot happening that we're not aware of. Great. Thank you. Sir Harriet. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I just want to put an already existing idea on the table here and, and get your comment on it. Um, I am not a fan of the mandatory ban the box rules. I have a feeling that, that the empirical research suggesting that it just leads to race and sex discrimination is probably right. Um, and I'm not usually a fan of federal subsidies uh, for purely private commercial behavior, but this may be a pretty good reason for me to go against that usual view. I understand that back in 1996, Congress passed a subsidy, um, I've written down what it's called, it was called the Work Opportunity Tax Credit Program, um, and it was, it was part of the Small Business Job Protection Act, which gave a, a small subsidy to employers willing to hire um, job applicants who have a, a, a criminal record. Um, and it was intended to be temporary, but it seems to have been renewed. I don't know what the status of it is right now. Uh, but I'd like your comment on, on that, whether it works. Do you know of any empirical evidence to suggest that that does actually increase the number um, of, of ex-felons um, who get jobs? Are there any state programs like this? This, do, this I'm throwing out to all of you, because I don't know who would be the most knowledgeable about this. I know a little bit about it. Um, I, I know that the federal subsidies, tax subsidies, have not been a topic of conversation I, in this whole discourse. I suspect that's because it has not had a very great effect. It has not been sufficient to really encourage when measured against all the pressures against, whether they're coming from the insurance 
industry or what. Let me, since you mentioned small business, I will note an area that's a great trouble to me, and that is the barriers that the Small Business Administration places uh, to people with a record in getting uh, loans. Uh, and that is uh, uh, something that federal law controls and that nobody really has paid very much attention to. But there are specific collateral consequences that affect small business opportunities that that would be a wonderful area if you wanted to look into that a little bit. So the thing I like about the tax subsidy is the notion that you know this is something where the individual employer will know, hey, I have a job where I don't really think the risk is that great, as opposed to a ban the box approach where everybody's in the same boat regardless of the particular job it is. Because most employers know, hey, I've got a job here that really isn't that that you know the sort of job that where this is going to be a problem. The person's going to be very closely supervised, uh, and they might even have a particular job out where they think, okay, this person is not going to be that great a risk. Whereas ban the box um, is very rigid um, and, <coughs> excuse me, uh, can put people in a situation where they're entering into to transactions that aren't really voluntary. They wouldn't do it if they knew if they knew what the risks were. This is one where both parties are going in with their eyes open. We have five minutes left. I just want to uh, move us to the vice chair's questions. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Madam Chair, I just have uh, two quick uh, questions. Uh, the first one, um, and I don't know, perhaps the uh, train has gone too far down the road, but um, you know that we will be making both findings and recommendations. And so my uh, question relates to um, the statements that have been made to the effect that the internet, um, it's not uncommon for the internet to be used by employers and others uh, seeking uh, information regarding felony convictions. Um, my question is whether those uh, records um, should be accessible uh, to the public. Um, are thinking on uh, where we are at this time, uh, we have, for example, uh, as it relates to um, body cameras and the information that is obtained as a result of that, uh, many jurisdictions are not uh, permitting the public to access uh, that. Uh, in fact, you've got to get some kind of court order or, or something to it, to it. Um, I was just wondering whether uh, would like for someone to discuss whether, um, you know, these criminal records uh, should be accessible to the public, you know, whether there's something that we can do as we seek to balance, uh, you know, the stigmatization that comes with uh, convictions uh, with our concern for, for public safety. So this is John Malcolm, and thank you for that, that question. Uh, there's, of course, a big difference between body cameras and information that's available on the internet. Uh, body cameras are under the control of law enforcement authorities or government property, and you can have regulations as to what it is it has with government property. I think one problem that was pointed out, I think it was by Margaret Love, is that uh, criminal records are notoriously inaccurate. And I'm in favor of anything that, uh, that will help to clean up that system and to give people an opportunity to get access to their records and to, to clean them up uh, to make sure that they are at least uh, at least accurate. But any attempt uh, to tinker with the internet, she also referred to you know a right to be forgotten, which is a, a right that is uh, recognized yeah. in Europe, I think has all kinds of First Amendment implications. And I would be personally totally opposed to any attempt to regulate the internet uh, in that way. But anything that, that cleans up records, I understand. And I also recognize that by not recognizing a, a, a right to be forgotten, that there will be people who in their past will have have done something bad and that lives forever on the internet uh, and and that person will be part of my language screwed but uh, but you know I, I I think that the cost of tinkering with the internet in that way and the First Amendment implications involved are just too severe to go down that road well I guess where I was um, coming from is that uh, for the information often to be placed on the internet, folks have gone to the courts 
to access the information. Might there be a point um, where uh, that information could be controlled uh, by the courts in the sense that, you know, it certainly can, can and would be released, but, um, you know, you'd have to jump through certain hoops in order to get it. I'd just like to point out that even if uh, the processing by private companies and of in criminal records aside, most departments of corrections have their entire inmate population as well as many have their entire probationer populations and their criminal records, marks, scars, tattoos, and photographs online, publicly accessible, readily available, and um, often don't take those records down post-release. So the issue is that all of this information has always been public, but perhaps not the identifying information and such, but it, because of technological advances now, it's easy to access. Um, so it's not just a problem with um, private companies and internet searches. It's also a problem of millions of um, offenders uh, are online because of official sources. So we are at time, but I know Commissioner Edegbo had some questions, so I'm going to give us five minutes over for this. Thank you, Madam Chair. A, a couple of data points that um, any of you that can speak to, I'd be grateful if you could clarify for us. So I'm wondering if there is any best source of evidence about how the infractions that carry collateral consequences have expanded over time. That's one, and let me give you the other one. I'll give them to you at, this, at the same time since time is short. Um, the second is there's been lots of talk about the insurance implications of reemployment uh, following incarceration in the context of collateral consequences. Are there data sources on how prevalent these negligent hiring suits are in the category that relate to collateral consequences? There's a big range of negligent hiring cases that may ha have nothing to do with collateral consequences per se. Has anybody taken a look or taken a study to find out empirically how big an issue this is to inform the discussions and suggestions about the way in which that operates? And then finally, there is some discussion about the role of state or local responses and federal responses. We, we heard from Commissioner Harriet that maybe tax incentives could be one federal response. Where are you on the role of state or federal responses to this? Would model legislation requiring a demonstration of non-tenuousness be helpful? Um, I can speak to negligent hiring. Um, there is a chapter in the treatise that I'm a co-author of on negligent hiring, and I'd be glad to provide you with um, that, um, that material. Uh, let me say that there is uh, very little litigation on negligent hiring that involves criminal records. Very little, although it is it looms very, very large in the the uh, uh, thought uh, calculus of uh, employers. But it, there's very, very little. Um, and the other uh, the other issue, the third issue, you had remind me. I. Sorry, it was the state or federal um, dichotomy, and are there are there ways to have um, some type of state model legislation, for example, that would require legislatures to go through the books and get the underbrush out of all of these non-tenuous um, laws that are in place to have collateral consequences? Yeah. Well, there are several uniform law proposals. The Uniform Law Commission has one. The American Law Institute has one. My own feeling is that rather than try to attack the collateral consequences themselves, it's better to propose avoidance mitigation um, st statutes so that you can, uh, you, you can provide people with a way to avoid them and, and get past them. And that's a more productive way. And there are many, many states that are doing that right now. There have been 40 states in the past four years that have passed laws addressing collateral consequences, relief in particular. Um, there's been very little interest in the federal government, although just for the record, the Fair Credit Reporting Act 
is supposed to regulate the provision of background checks. Um, it is not very effectively enforced. Um, if it were, there would be a lot less problem with inaccurate records and with, with people being unfairly eliminated because of the background checking issue. Are you all are now standing between last and lunch, so proceed quickly. <laughs> Then I'll just briefly say on the question of the growth in collateral consequences, uh, I don't have a good stat for that, but on the more narrow question of the growth in occupational licensing burdens, the Obama administration actually put out a report in July of 2015 where I'm absolutely certain that they had a uh, figure, and I'm going to try and find it and send, you, uh, send it to you, Commissioner, that compared uh, the number of professions subject to licensure in 1950 versus whatever recent year that they chose, and it was very striking to see the difference. Thank you all. Obviously, we were so interested in your presentations that we wanted to go along. I really appreciate both what you had to say today and what you prepared before today and, and your ongoing work. Thanks very much. Now, I invite our next panel to come up. And as you are coming, we will put out name tags so you'll know where to be. And I will begin introducing you so that we can try to make up some of our time. Uh, in the order in which our next panel will speak, they are Mark Maurer, Executive Director of the Sentencing Project, Hans Von Spakovsky, Senior Legal Fellow with the Mies Center for Legal and Judicial Studies at the Heritage Foundation. James Benal, Assistant Professor of Law, Criminology, and Criminal Justice at California State University, Long Beach. And Anna Roberts, Assistant Professor at the Seattle University School of Law and Fellow with the Fred T. Korematsu Center for Law and Inequality. Thank you, each of you. Mr. Maurer, when you are ready, you can begin. And I'll just say while you're pouring water, it's helpful if you turn your microphone off when you're done speaking because we can only have so many microphones on at the same time to be able to have them work. So on that, Mr. Harriet, will you turn yours off? <clears throat> it's on? Okay. We're ready. Go ahead. Sure. Well, thank you so much for inviting me here and for taking on these important issues. Uh, my focus today will be the policy of felony disenfranchisement, the loss of voting rights with a felony conviction. Last November, we had, of course, a major national election. Uh, there were six million people who didn't participate in that election, not necessarily because they didn't care about the outcome, but because of what I would view as antiquated policies that deny the right to vote for people with a felony conviction. Uh, these policies go back to the time of the founding of this country. They were a holdover from the colonial period. When this country was founded as great experiment democracy, as we know, it was a very limited experiment at the time. Women couldn't vote, African Americans, illiterates, poor people, and also people with felony convictions. And over the course of 200 years, these other prohibitions have been done away with. We look back on them with a great deal of national embarrassment now. And the disenfranchised people with felony convictions is one of the main remaining blocks of full participation in voting. The state of disenfranchisement today, these policies are state driven. Uh, 48 states prohibit voting for people in prison, uh, District of Columbia as well. 34 of these states also disenfranchise people on probation and or parole. And of these states, 12 states disenfranchise some or all people even after they've completed their sentence, including four states that disenfranchise everyone with a felony conviction for the rest of their lives. The only way they can regain their right to vote is by getting a pardon from a governor or a pardon board. Uh, the number of people affected by these policies has risen along with the tremendous rise in the criminal justice system over the last four decades, 1970 76, about 1 million people were disenfranchised. That figure is 6 million today. Not surprisingly, the racial disparities we see in the justice system translate into disenfranchisement disparities as well, so that nationally an estimated one of every 13 African Americans is prohibited from voting. In four states, this figure is as high as one in five. 
So why is this a problem? Uh, I think for two fundamental reasons. One is what do we mean by democracy in the 21st century? And secondly, I think this is counterproductive for public safety goals. Uh, in democracy, we don't normally impose a character test on the right to vote. If you're the right age and you're a citizen, you get to vote. That's the end of the story. Uh, if we look at other opportunities in society, even with a felony conviction, we don't normally take away people's fundamental rights of citizenship. So if you have a felony conviction, you can still get married or divorced, you can buy or sell properly. Uh, we generally separate out legitimate punishments in the court system from your rights as a citizen. The implication of this, what happens is that we may have someone who's a parent, committed a crime, is sentenced to probation, is living in the community. Uh, he or she is not permitted to vote in a local school board election that will affect the future of, of their children. That's what disenfranchisement does. In terms of the public safety goals, uh, when people come back to the community or are living under probation or parole supervision or have completed their sentence, we expect them to abide by the rules and regulations of society. Uh, we know that a critical factor in successful reentry is engagement with positive institutions in the community, having a job, a place to live, a good peer network of support. When people are trying to accomplish all of those goals and they're essentially told, yes, you're back from prison now, but you are still a second class citizen, I don't think that's a very helpful message that we're sending to them in terms of where, uh, <clears throat> where we see them in our community. Uh, over the last 20 years, there have been a significant number of states that have enacted reforms to these policies, beginning in 1997 in Texas, which at the time had a two-year ban on voting even after people completed their sentence. That law, that repeal, was signed into law by then-Governor George W. Bush. Since then, 23 other states signed into law by both Democratic and Republican governors have enacted some type of reform. A number of these have been relatively modest, involve informing people of how to go about regaining their voting rights. A number of states, though, have enacted significant reconsideration of policies. So, for example, New Mexico and Maryland have done away with the ban on post-sentence voting. Three states, Rhode Island, Connecticut, and Maryland, have extended voting to people on probation or parole. Despite these reforms, though, as I've mentioned, the numbers of people disenfranchised has gone up to six million today. Uh, as is true of our criminal justice policies generally, the United States is at one end of the spectrum among industrialized nations in the severity of our policies. Uh, if we look at how uh, nations in Western Europe and Canada approach disenfranchisement. In many of these nations, there's no prohibition on voting, uh, thus allowing people to vote in prison as well. Of those nations that practice some type of disenfranchisement, it's almost always limited solely to the time in prison, never to probation or parole, and certainly never to people who've completed their sentences. There have also been constitutional court decisions in nations as diverse as Canada, Israel, South Africa, and the European Court of Human Rights, all affirming that citizenship rights are very different from criminal punishment. So in general, I think disenfranchisement fails to achieve or even address any of the legitimate goals of the criminal justice system or sentencing. It exacerbates the racial disparities that are so prevalent in the criminal justice system and so troubling. Uh, after 200 years, I think we need a very different approach than the founders had uh, at the time in the 18th century. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mr. Maurer. Mr. Brun Blakovsky. Uh, Madam Chairman and Commissioner, thank you very much for inviting me to, uh, here to uh, testify today. Uh, as you've been hearing all morning, there are a variety of collateral consequences that attach to a criminal conviction, although losing the right to vote is probably the best known. Uh, first of all, of course, there's prison and jail time often. There are other direct penalties, such as fines, court costs, restitution, 
and possible probation and parole, but there are also the other disabilities we've been discussing, which include uh, losing the right to own a gun, to work as a police officer in many places, to work as a public school teacher, to hold certain professional licenses, uh, to be a notary republic, or to serve on a jury. The time in prison has never been uh, the only way that a felon is punished for breaking the law, endangering his fellow citizens, and intentionally violating the rules of our civil society. Uh, the point I'd like to make today is that it's important for the Commission to understand that Congress does not have the constitutional authority to uh, force states to restore voting rights of convicted felons. While, as Marcus said, many states automatically restore the right uh, to vote, and two states actually allow you to vote uh, while you were in prison, uh, others do require individual applications and impose waiting periods, which uh, make sense, frankly, because of the high recidivism rate of felons. The point is that the citizens of each state are entitled to make this decision. The Constitution gives the states the authority to uh, determine the qualifications of voters in Article I and the 17th Amendment, and that exclusive authority was recently confirmed by the U.S. Supreme Court in Arizona versus Intertribal Council of Arizona in 2013. Section 2 of the 14th Amendment uh, specifically and very explicitly give states the rights to abridge the right to vote of citizens for participation in rebellion or other crime. Uh, the 14th Amendment simply recognizes uh, a process that goes back to ancient Greek and Rome, which I think Ms. Love mentioned. And it's important to understand that this was a Reconstruction Amendment passed by uh, Republicans who supported black voting rights. Now, the claim that these state laws are all rooted in racial discrimination is historically in inaccurate. Even prior to the Civil War, when black Americans uh, could not vote, a majority of states took away the voting rights of people who convict were convicted of crimes. In fact, 70 percent of the states in 1861 uh, had these types of laws on the books. It is true that five southern states passed race-targeted felon disenfranchisement laws from 1890 to 1910, but those laws have all been changed. The case cannot be made today that such laws are in any way applied in a discriminatory fashion. When they have been, they have been struck down, as the U.S. Supreme Court did Alabama law in Hunter v. Underwood in 1985. No showing of intentional discrimination can be made with regard to such laws today, and all recent attempts in court to do so have failed. That includes lawsuits filed under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act claiming that these laws have a discriminatory effect. All such cases have been thrown out by the courts, including in the 1st, 2nd, 9th, and 11th Circuit Courts of Appeal. As the Federal District Court said in Johnson v. Florida, which was the unsuccessful voting rights lawsuit against Florida's felon voting law, quote, uh, black ex-felons have not been denied the right to vote because of an immutable characteristic but because of their own criminal acts. This is also true of the non-African American class members. Thus, it is not racial discrimination that deprives felons, black or white, of their right to vote, but their own decision to commit an act for which they assume the risks of detection and punishment. Now, even if Congress had the constitutional authority to change state policies, there are sound public policy reasons why it should not. As I've said, the loss of certain civil rights is part of the sanction our society has determined should be applied to criminals. Uh, if states believe that felons should be able to vote in prison, as Maine and Vermont did, if the citizens of that state have made that decision, that is fine. They have the right to do that. If other states, such as Nebraska, believe you should have a two-year waiting period, uh, that is perfectly reasonable and common sense because, according to the U.S. Department of Justice, two-thirds of felons are arrested for a new crime within three years at three quarters within five years, showing that they lack the responsibility, trustworthiness, and commitment to our laws that we expect. The argument, and let me again say, I, I actually agree with many of the things that have been said here this morning. Reintegration is very important, uh, and I think there are certain other collateral, collateral consequences that don't make any sense. Um, particularly, for example, the loss of driver's licenses for uh, crimes that have nothing to do with driving. However, the argument that automatically reenfranchising felons will immediately integrate them into society is kind of like saying, well, because 
if you have a college degree, you're going to have a much higher income than other individuals, then we should just automatically uh, award college degrees to indiv individuals, and we're going to have that effect. In fact, giving felons something to strive for, which is during a waiting period of showing that they have actually turned over a new leaf, that they have changed their life, ar uh, uh, life around, and that, in fact, they can be trusted to uh, exercise the rights of a citizen by voting, seems to me to be a, a good thing to do. Uh, but again, I want to emphasize uh, it's up to the people of each state uh, to make this decision. Um, the one thing I would point out in, in, in ending this is that there have been many bills uh, dropped in Congress and elsewhere to automatically restore the right to vote of individuals when they get out of prison. What I always find interesting about those is that um, those bills don't want to automatically restore all of the other collateral rights we're talking about. And if, in fact, we believe that an individual has turned over a new leaf, has turned their life around, has now decided that, in fact, they are willing to, to live by the rules that previously they had intentionally broken, if we can trust them in the polling booth, well, then obviously we should be able to trust them in the jury box or in the community to exercise, for example, their Second Amendment rights. And I don't think it makes sense to say, for example, uh, that they should automatically receive their right to vote back, but have all these other collateral consequences still apply. Thanks, Thanks very much, Mr. Ponsvitskowski. Professor Bindel? Good afternoon, morning. Uh, to start, I'd like to thank the Commission for the opportunity to take part in what I consider a very important briefing. I am currently an assistant professor at California State University, Long Beach, and I am also a former offender. Uh, in 1999, I caused a DUI accident to claim the life of my passenger, who was my best friend. I subsequently spent four years, one month, and six days in two maximum security prisons. While in prison, I took my LSATs in the hope of one day going to law school. Upon my release in 2004, I began my legal studies. In 2008, I was admitted to the California State Bar and began my legal career as a criminal defense attorney while pursuing a PhD. A year later, I was summoned to jury duty for the first time as a California resident. When I arrived at the courthouse on my day of service, I passed through security using the entrance designated attorneys only. Soon thereafter, courthouse personnel instructed me to complete a juror qualification questionnaire. On that questionnaire, was an inquiry regarding criminal convictions, in particular whether I had been convicted of a felony or malfeasance in office. I answered yes. Moments after turning in this questionnaire, I was called to the front of the jury lounge where I was informed by the jury commissioner that I was permanently ineligible for jury service in California because of my prior felony conviction and I would never be summoned again. I protested mildly, explaining that I was an attorney, had used the special entrance, and was told that I should write my congressman if I was unhappy about California's juror eligibility requirements. Instead of writing my congressman, I wrote an article comparing jurisdictional felon jury exclusion policies and bar admittance procedures. What I found was that in 29 states in the federal system, a convicted felon could be admitted to the bar and practice law, but is forever banned from serving as a juror in either a criminal or civil matter. I offer this background by way of explanation about how and why I've spent the past five years studying a topic that receives very little scholarly or legislative attention. I also offer this background as the first of several examples of the contradictions and inconsistency inherent in what's commonly known as felon jury exclusion. Of the collateral consequences that impact the citizen's ability to take part in democratic processes, felon jury exclusion is the most pervasive. 49 states, the District of Columbia, and the federal system categorically restrict a convicted felon's opportunity to serve as a juror. Of these jurisdictions, 28 bar convicted felons from the jury process permanently, eliminating an estimated 13 million citizens, roughly, from this vital form of democratic participation. Maine is the only U.S. jurisdiction that places no restrictions on a convicted felon's opportunity to serve. With only two exceptions, jurisdictions that restrict convicted felons' opportunities to serve do so categorically, barring all convicted felons, regardless of offense type, from jury service in both civil and criminal cases. Justifying these exclusionary statutes, courts and lawmakers allege that convicted felons would jeopardize the jury process because they purportedly lack the character to follow the law during deliberations, 
and or harbor this inherent bias, making them adversarial towards the state and unduly sympathetic to criminal defendants. My own work contemplates the legal and policy implications of felon jury exclusion statutes. In terms of their legality, of course, we all know the Supreme Court has held that jurisdictions are free to confine jury selection to those possessing good intelligence, sound judgment, and fair character. Legal challenges to felon jury exclusion statutes have taken two forms, fair cross-section claims and equal protection claims. Neither has met with success. Courts seemingly accept the premise that federal and state court systems have a legitimate interest in protecting the impartiality of juries and that categorical felon jury exclusion statutes are an apt way to serve that goal. As a policy, the utility of felon jury exclusion statutes is questionable. In my own research, I have in part set out to test for the first time in a series of pilot studies the proffered rationales for the exclusion of convicted felons from jury service. My first empirical study and the first on this topic focused on this inherent bias rationale. And what I found was that the pretrial biases of convicted felons were far from homogenous. In fact, they varied significantly. I also found no statistically significant difference between the pretrial biases of felon jurors in the study and those of law student jurors in the study which begs the question, if the inherent bias rationale is truly a mechanism for eliminating potentially corrupting bias from the jury system, and there are other identifiable groups that harbor similarly dangerous biases, should they also not be excluded? And should they too be categorically barred from the process, or is there another potentially more nefarious purpose for banishing convicted felons from jury service? In another study, and I'm short on time here, in another study I focused on the character rationale, and what I found there also was that convicted felons approached the deliberation process thoughtfully and enthusiastically. This was a mock jury experiment, suggesting that convicted felons at a minimum don't taint jury deliberations, but in fact may enhance the deliberation process. I also conducted some field work in Maine, where I did interviews with former offenders. And what I found there was that former offenders spoke of their inclusion in the jury selection process and in the jury process generally as a corroboration of their reformation as a certification of their change. And they also noted how removing barriers to reentry helps a former offender build a personal narrative that acknowledges a criminal past while allowing for a law-abiding present. As many scholars have noted, this process of reconciling past events with present and future aspirations is a key component to criminal desistance and successful reentry. My research on felon jury exclusion, born out of an embarrassing public event, demonstrates themes common, I think, to all collateral sanctions and discretionary disabilities. Namely, that all offenders are alike and that all threaten institutions and processes we hold dear. Such restrictions are rife with presumption and stereotype and almost always lack a mechanism by which we judge a former offender based on his or her specific circumstances and characteristics. Indeed, in the case of felon jury exclusion, we even disregard an existing process designed to take the time to consider citizens at a personal, individualized level, jury selection. As a result, we may damage our jury system by barring citizen who can make valuable contributions to a jury's effort to find truth and justice. In closing, I'd like to thank again the commission for recognizing this nearly invisible form of disenfranchisement. Look, certainly including convicted felons in the jury process will not fix many of the issues that plague our jury system and will not assure the successful reintegration of former offenders. Still, Inclusion will very likely aid broader efforts to make juries more representative and to remove obstacles to reentry that dehumanize former offenders and undermines what it means to be a citizen and to participate meaningfully in our democracy. Thank you. Thanks very much, Professor Bonnell. Professor Roberts. Good morning. I have seven points for my seven minutes. First of all, state legislatures have found enormous variety in the ways in which, by statute, they exclude people with convictions from jury service. This variety, for example, in what triggers exclusion and in how long exclusions last. We've heard that 48 of our states and the federal government uh, have legislation that permits or demands exclusion of those with felony records. But there are also 13 states that exclude on the basis of at least some misdemeanors. And some states have legislation that exclude on the basis of, of something shorter, uh, short of a conviction, in other words, an arrest or a charge or an indictment or jail. And while some states end the exclusion when prison ends or when the sentence ends, others impose lifetime bans, absent a pardon. As one federal judge has said, the variety shown by these state approaches makes this ban seem somewhat arbitrary, as well as having other problems, which I'll discuss later. 
Second, one gets a very incomplete picture if one looks only at statutory exclusion on this basis. There are a variety of other filters that serve to remove those with criminal records from our juries. First, people may not receive a jury summons if, as commonly happens, jury lists are drawn from voting rooms. Second, jury service may not be affordable or accessible. Third, potential jurors may be removed for cause, in other words, because a judge is persuaded that they can't be fair. And fourth, potential jurors with criminal records are frequently removed by means of peremptory challenges. When accused of purposeful racial discrimination in their peremptory challenges, prosecutors frequently respond by asserting that their reason for striking a juror was the juror's connection with the criminal justice system. And such reasons are typically found race neutral and non-discriminatory, despite obvious disparate impact, impact risk and risk of pretext. Third, there are two states that do not exclude petit jurors uh, by statute, Colorado and Maine. The abandoning of this exclusion in the 80s was important in that it took off the books the message of automatic unfitness that these exclusions send. But my conversations with trial attorneys in these states suggest that to some extent the other filtering methods step in to fill the gap. Prosecutors, for example, can often access data that includes not only convictions, but also arrests for potential jurors. So during jury selection, they may use this data to make sure that people with records are removed, whether through challenges for cause or through peremptory challenges. Even if prosecutors don't dig into jurors' records, jury questionnaires may ask the question, have you ever been convicted, and thus bring convictions to light. It's not that there's no concrete effect of the lack of statutory exclusions in these states. For example, one of the attorneys I spoke with in Maine says it's not uncommon for those with misdemeanor convictions to serve, but these are certainly no panacea. Fourth, what all of the filtering devices have in common is the compounding of racial disparity. If we agree that criminal enforcement in this country is racially skewed, then this process takes that skewing, uses it in formation of the jury, which in turn through its decision-making risks, creating more racial skewing. To see the extent of the problem, we need more data. A scholar named Brian Kelt, in an article from 2003 on this topic, proposed the following figures. He said that 13 million people, including about 30% uh, of black men are banned for life because they have felony convictions. But that data is over a decade old and it's incomplete in that it focuses only on statutory exclusions and only on felony exclusions. And as I've mentioned, the exclusions go much broader. Fifth, in amidst all this gloom, there are some reform proposals pending. Legislation is being debated in Nevada and in Alabama that would ease the restoration of rights. And legislation is being debated in California that would lessen the amount of jury exclusion that happens in the first place. The analysis accompanying the California bill is particularly interesting. It runs through three commonly stated purposes of exclusion and critiques each of them using Professor Benal's work heavily. The first is the assertion that felony convictions show disrespect and disregard for the law. The second is the assertion that people with felony convictions have an inherent bias against the government. The third is the assertion that people with felony convictions lack the ability to consider evidence fairly and to follow instructions. The legislative analysis adds two other points. First, that the best jury is one that consists of people who have a wealth of experience and perspective. And second, that the racial impact of these exclusions reduces the fairness of juries. My sixth point is that, as you've heard, while it's true that each state provides, at least on paper, some method for some to combat statutory exclusion, this should not be seen as solving the problem. First, while some states restore rights automatically, many require affirmative efforts. These in turn require time, money, and a good attorney, things that those most in need of relief aren't likely to have. And a pardon is often required. The granting of pardons is infrequent and in some instances stained by racial disparity. And finally, even if there's a way out of the statutory exclusion, the other methods of exclusion may remain. My seventh and final point, this is an area that lacks empirical data, not only to reveal the full extent of the racial disparity, but also, at least until my co-panelist began his work, to investigate the extent to which any of the justifications given for exclusion has any support. 
if there is inadequate support, and even more so if, as Professor Benal's work suggests, there's empirical data that opposes the assumptions in this area, it's time to dismantle these exclusions. And in my work, I have recommended an end to automatic exclusion on this basis, whether that exclusion is being done through selective mailing of summonses, statutory exclusions, or automatic granting of uh, challenges for calls. I've also recommended what I think are necessary corollaries, further policing of peremptory challenges, and a reduction of prosecutorial peremptory challenges, as well as urgent efforts to make jury service accessible and affordable for all. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor Roberts, and to the full panel. I'll now open the floor for questions from my fellow commissioners. Commissioner Kersnett. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the panel. I just have two very, uh, I think, narrow questions, and um, I suspect uh, either Professors Benal or Roberts may have the answer to this. And if it was your material, I apologize. I uh, confess to not uh, completely doing my homework on this. Uh, is there any data that you're aware of that compares the percentage of felons who are excluded pursuant to peremptory or cause challenges versus those who are non-felons? No, as Professor Banal hinted, there's just an empirical void here, and that is one area of void. And is there, and I suspect the answer to this is also going to be no, is there any data that shows the percentage of felons who are struck pursuant to any challenges um, in criminal cases versus civil cases? No. Okay. Thank you. No. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you for the testimony. It was very helpful. I, I have a question that is similar to the question that I asked the last panel, which asks all of you whether or not you're aware of data that would show the expansion of crimes that uh, are subject to felon disenfranchisement over time. That is to say, when we begin with the historical precedent that there have been disenfranchisement penalties for a long time, I think it's also important to consider how many such crimes carried that sanction. It's my understanding that over time this has expanded, which is part of why we come to the problem of felon disenfranchisement. And I'm wondering if there is data, empirical or otherwise, that could speak to that. This is the, I think that, that certainly is true with other collateral consequences. But when it comes to voting, actually, I, I think it has somewhat shrunk. And, and you, you can see that in the fact that um, some of the laws that were actually thrown out by the courts. If you go to the Alabama example, Alabama very intentionally changed its law during Jim Crow and Reconstruction to add in, it wasn't just felony convictions, but they put in this term of, uh, you, you could have your right to vote uh, uh, be taken away if you committed a crime of moral turpitude. I have no idea what moral turpitude is, but the whole point of that was to give this general ability to interpret almost any crime in order to be able to take away the right to vote. That, that has all been thrown out by the courts. The only, the only crimes that can be used today to lose the right to vote are, are felonies, and certainly misdemeanors cannot be used for that. that that's what the courts have said about that. Sorry, Mr. Maurer, bef before you jump in, uh, is, is it the case that the number of felonies in, in state and federal codes is much larger today? than the number of felonies that, in the 1800s, or that, am I mistaken? That very well may be. I mean, we've, as you know, we've had this terrible increased expansion uh, of those. And in fact, you, you probably know, I mean, we have this whole project uh, at, at Heritage, along with the ACLU and others, to try to defelonize many criminal and other laws because uh, uh, Congress in particular has been very bad about passing um, statutes that don't no longer have a knowing and intentional you know, requirement, which should be a basic requirement for any kind of felony conviction. So that, that is certainly true, but, but the kind of lesser crimes that normally could be included in prior years, that's no longer there. 
I would just add, um, first on the Alabama case, yes, it, it was uh, thrown out. Uh, I would add it took 100 years before that uh, finally was thrown out and 100 years of discrimination. Uh, in, since in most states, uh, every felony results in disenfranchisement, uh, it's not necessarily a, a significant change. It, it gets complicated in states like Alabama and Mississippi, and there's been litigation legislation in recent years because uh, whether it's crimes of so-called moral turpitude or identified crimes, uh, there's been a great deal of confusion about who is actually disenfranchised in the state. For example, in 1890, uh, possession of crack cocaine was not a felony on the books or so. And so uh, substantial numbers of people now are in prison for drug offenses. And the question is, you know, uh, are they disenfranchised as well? So it's gone back and forth on that. Is there any information about whether or not there are intergenerational consequences of the magnitude of uh, voting bars? That is to say, um, one might hypothesize that voting is a learned behavior. And if a large percentage of, take for instance, the African-American community is excluded from participation by virtue of these laws, might that have carry on effects? Well, there are, there's not a lot of research. There are a couple of studies that suggest that there's a spillover effect of disenfranchisement in high incarceration communities. So essentially, uh, in many low-income African-American communities where disenfranchisement rates are high, you get a depressed voter turnout even among African-Americans who don't have a felony conviction themselves. And I think essentially what's going on there is that voting tends to be a social activity. Uh, you know, we discuss the upcoming election with our spouses and partners, uh, neighbors drive to the polls together, things like that. When you have such a substantial number of people in a given community can't vote, uh, it may very likely depress that conversation, that collegiality in the process and things like that. So uh, again, there's not a lot of research, but what is out there does suggest that it depresses over all turned out as well. I, if I can respond real quickly to that. Uh, the Census Bureau, as you probably know, puts out reports after federal elections. Is it on? Yeah. Okay. The, the, Census, the Census Bureau puts out reports after federal elections. And I believe, I think it was the 2012 election. It may have been the 2008, but I believe it was the 2012 election. They put out a census report actually showing that um, uh, the turnout of African Americans across the country was uh, one of its highest levels, two percentage points above that of white Americans. So it was actually uh, quite historic uh, uh, when they put out this report. I don't understand that to be responsive to Mr. Mauer's point, though. It, am I correct? Right. It's possible that the African American rate would have been 10 percent higher or something like that without disenfranchisement. Can I just can I speak to the historical question in terms of the, the jury picture? There's not been any sort of systematic analysis of the sort you might be hoping for. The last um, sort of tranche of data that was collected, uh, well, there have been two. In 2003, there's an article by Brian Kaut that in an appendix tries to pull together what the, what the provisions were then. Then in 2012, I wrote an article in which I went back through, and there had not been that many, there had been no, I think, major changes in that time period, or not many. The big changes in, in our context happened in the 80s when Colorado and Maine abandoned their exclusions. So what I've tried to do in order to get the most accurate data possible is for the commission, I've put together a uh, chart of all states and what they do, and in there I've tried to flag the most recent changes. So I hope that's of some use. Thank you very much for that. Uh, just, just very quickly, um, Mr. Spakovsky, is there any federal power to take off the board certain qualification limitations for voters? If uh, Congress wants to change the qualifications for voters, they have to do it through a constitutional amendment. I mean, that's why we had to pass a constitutional amendment, for example, uh, when we raised the voting age from, um, tw dropped it from 21 to 18. You may recall there was a Supreme Court case on, on this, and because of that Supreme Court decision, uh, we very quickly passed a constitutional amendment during the uh, you know, Vietnam, height of the Vietnam War uh, to, to do that. Now, the one thing that Congress certainly could do is they could change the federal law that says that once you're convicted of a felony, you no longer can exercise your Second Amendment right. 
and that could be changed so that if if for example um, uh, you know, they could tie it to states, just to what a state does. So, for example, if a state uh, restores your civil rights, either through a pardon process or through uh, some kind of automatic process, um, they could tie the federal statute in to say that at the same time your other civil rights are restored, including voting, then you will also regain your Second Amendment rights under this federal statute. And just so you can help us, can you explain the nexus between the Second Amendment and voting eligibility? No, I, I, the nexus that I see is that, look, we have all these different collateral consequences for the conviction of a felony. And it just seems to me that if, if you, if a state or others make the decision that you are now trustworthy enough to once again go into a polling booth and make decisions on the rules that are going to govern our society, then why would we not trust you to also uh, sit in a jury box? or be a notary uh, public, or to once again be able to exercise your Second Amendment rights. To me, it doesn't make sense to say, well, we think you now are um, have changed your behavior and you have the judgment to do one of these, but we don't trust you to have the judgment to do these others. To, to me, it's all kind of tied together and it's just inconsistent to say you should have one of these rights back but not the other right back. We do appreciate that we have a materially lower bar for voting than for almost anything else uh, that is part of democratic citizenship, though, right? Yes, but the whole point of uh, the whole point of a felony conviction is that you intentionally and knowingly decided to break the rules of the civil compact of, uh, under which we live. When you're going into a voting booth, uh, you are uh, making decisions through the people you choose on what those rules are going to be. And I think that's very directly related. In fact, I'll give you a quick quote, if I may, from uh, one of the representatives in Massachusetts. Uh, Massachusetts used to be the third state in the country that allowed felons to vote in prison. And in a 2000 uh, referendum, the people of this very blue state overwhelmingly voted to take that right away. And one of the legislators, um, one of the legislators said, we incarcerate people and we take away their right to run their own lives and leave them with the ability to influence how we run our lives. And that was what led to them getting rid of the ability of felons to vote while in prison. Yeah, I, I'm going to take just one more moment on this because I was deeply offended by a statement in your uh, written testimony. You said that, <clears throat> are we to believe that a convicted child molester can be trusted to vote but cannot be trusted to be a teacher in a public school? And on behalf of our nation's great teachers, I found that equivalence uh, very, very distressing, given the material difference in what we expect from voters and what we expect from the people who will educate our children. But I will uh, pause there and invite Commissioner Young. Thank you very much, um, Madam Chair. You know, it's I'm I am also somewhat offended by uh, some of the discussion, mainly because. When you go through the prison system, you go through a set of procedures that are designed to take away your right of freedom. But it does not, for many other instances, take away other constitutional rights. You still have your right to petition. You still have your right to be treated uh, not subject to cruel and unusual punishment. You have the right to be treated not in a way based on the color of your skin, even inside prison walls. And there is a fundamental disconnect, I think, in stating, and it goes for both voting and it goes for the jury system. The idea that somehow the fact that you were in prison or you were convicted of a felony makes you self-interested in a way that is different than how anyone else in this country is self-interested. It presumes a narrow self-interest such that you could not be trusted with any judgment beyond that very narrow interest. And I find that completely fundamentally wrong. Secondly, even though Section 2 of the 14th Amendment talks about states conditioning the right, conditioning you know, the ability to vote based on, it fell in, based on insurrection, rebellion, or what have you, it's also clear that that, is, that in itself is still subject to the, the protections of the 14th Amendment. And even though it will not happen uh, certainly in the, in the next few years. The idea that you can use the 14th Amendment uh, as a means to 
create uh, a means of a presumption that you still are allowed the right to vote. That the, in, the indisputable facts are that this disproportionately impacts uh, minority communities. And as has been stated, it therefore disproportionately impacts the ability of those communities to be able to express themselves writ large uh, in, the, in the politics of America. I think that you can, you can indeed have a federal law that has a presumption that, that excluding felons from voting is per se unconstitutional, absent compelling circumstances um, along the lines of you know, the old pre-clearance test where states would have to submit whether or not these laws make any sense. What does seven years have to do with whether or not you, you, ca you can cast a vote or not? What does even two years have to do with that? Again, it, it's on a presumption that you are self-interested such to the extent that you are outside the bounds of society. Well, Commissioner Yaki, I'm going to encourage your brevity. I, I, I understand, but it, it is something that is, that when you comes right down to it, you hear this time and time again, and you look at, and you look at the websites and you see that it comes down to an issue of people who are, who are self-interested on a partisan political level um, to deny people these rights, and I find it very objectionable. I can speak to that self-interest in terms of juries. In our first study of inherent bias, we found that, in fact, one-third to a little over one-third of the jurors that we, we tested were, in fact, neutral or pro-prosecution, which was cut directly against this inherent bias rationale. So, just. I could just tell a, a quick anecdote that gets at some of this. Um, as Hans pointed out, Massachusetts previously previously allowed people in prison to vote, as did Utah for many years. Uh, back in the 1970s, uh, <clears throat> there was a prisoner in a western Massachusetts prison uh, who decided <clears throat> to run for the city council of the area where the prison was located. Uh, there were four candidates for city council. Uh, he came in fourth in the election, but what happened was he received 3,000 votes in the election. 1,500 came from within the prison and 1,500 came from the community. So 1,500 people in the community thought he was the best qualified candidate for the, uh, for the job at hand and had nothing to do with the fact that he was in prison and the other ones weren't. So, I mean, I think to make these gross generalizations about how people respond, what they think about the issues of the day, uh, I think is very much off target. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, I have a couple questions. One has to do with the question of what should the standards be uh, to allow people to get their ex-offenders to get their rights restored. So some have argued that ex-offenders need to have paid at least part of any court restitution to victims. But that strikes me as very challenging for many uh, people who are ex-offenders, we've already talked this morning about how difficult it is to get a job. And many ex-offenders come from communities where they're not coming from families of wealth and do not have the funds to pay restitution. Uh, is anyone troubled by the fact that, that that might make your right to vote actually dependent on your wealth? Uh, I think we should be troubled. Uh, the only good news uh, on that front, I think, is that there's, uh, just in recent years, I think there's increasing attention to this issue. A lot of it was generated <clears throat> from the findings in Ferguson and <clears throat> how uh, arrests of African Americans in particular was being used as a form of income generating for the, for the county and how widespread that was. And the Department of Justice and the previous administration was taking on this issue of uh, uh, just out of control fines and fees and costs that didn't take into account a person's ability to pay. So the ripple effects are, are quite broad here, uh, including potentially the right to vote as well. Um, I also am very interested in the work that uh, Professor Banal is doing on jury duty because I confess that I actually am not enthusiastic about jury duty. So it's great to see that, in fact, people are fighting uh, for that right. Um, what recommendations do you have? I was kind of actually surprised that the federal government itself, the federal courts, have such a blanket uh, prohibition. Uh, and I'm wondering what you would recommend 
uh, that federal courts do? Is there a model? Is there something that uh, we could be recommending in terms of what should at least be happening in federal courts? My recommendation would be follow Maine's lead. Uh, I don't know that a restriction is necessary. Uh, it, funny thing, I've done field research in Maine for the last few years. It, it's, it's a unique thing to see the state courthouse on one side of the street and the federal courthouse up the street. Um, and you, me, if I was a Maine resident, would be, you know, a perfectly fine juror in the state courthouse, but not so in the federal courthouse. Makes little sense to me, sort of a, a weird paradox. Uh, I would say remove all restrictions, statutory restrictions. The informal restrictions that Professor Robert speaks of, not informal, but preemptive strikes, challenges for cause. I think those are more challenging. As far as the formal restrictions that I study, uh, I'd say follow Maine's lead. And is there a movement uh, to restore more uh, participation in juries on the state level? Because we hear, of course, a lot of the, there's a national movement on the issue of uh, felt of ex-offender reenfranchisement, but very little about juries. For a while, I think it was us, but. Um, <laughs> it was, you are the national yeah, movement. I don't have to, uh, California does have some initiatives going. Uh, that's where I teach, so that's what I'm most familiar with, but uh, Professor Roberts might be able to speak to this as well. Yeah, I hadn't heard much about it until I looked into the pending legislation that I mentioned, I think both Nevada and California. And there were groups that had been vocal in the side, on the side of um, lifting the exclusions or at least narrowing them. On the other side, you had DAs and, and police officers, but you had a variety of uh, organizations lobbying for the lifting or the narrowing of these exclusions. So I certainly don't want to downplay the work that's being done. I think it's just not reaching uh, the mainstream, even the mainstream legal scholarly uh, audience, and I wish it was. And is there any research being done to connect uh, the ability to participate in juries with try reducing recidivism and uh, increasing people's ability to reintegrate back into society? The only work I know of is the work I did in Maine. And, I, I, and that work seems to suggest that um, it can change self-perception, right? which is in a tiny little piece in this big broad cloth, um, that it can change self-perception in the fact that the state has recognized that you are now fit to do something we ask you to do. And that's important or was important to the, to the folks that I interviewed and spoke to. I flagged one other study in the materials I submitted, uh, Hans and Vidmar, who um, produced data suggesting that jury service can pr um, improve or increase forms of other civic participation. So that's in your materials. Um, but beyond that, I, I don't know about yourself. Thank you. Yes. Commissioner Claudia. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for your presentation. There, lights on. This question is to everyone, but I'd like to start with Mr. Von Spaskowski. God, I, can, I have never been able to pronounce your name. I apologize. I have been trying for five and a half years, but I apologize. That, that's okay. I, I was the Supreme Court recently, and the Chief Justice stumbled over it. <laughs> well, um, if I may rationalize uh, your testimony on why people should not be allowed to vote with a, with a conviction, a felony conviction, it's basically trustworthiness and I would assume judgment. Yeah, but I just want to make clear, I, I'm not saying that they should not get their right to vote back. I don't know. I, I, I think they should. I understand that. And you were uh, vague in that regard as to how, because every state is different. Uh, my state has some kind of complex, if you have one felony conviction and it's nonviolent, you can get your right to vote back. But if you have two felony convictions, you can't get your right. Make, it took me several times to read it to understand right. it. Uh, nonetheless, I wonder, you know, when you talk about trustworthiness, uh, we have uh, different punishments uh, that are imposed for felonies. Uh, uh, that would be uh, you can get probation, which means the court and society trust you to continue to function in society uh, with some sort of supervision. Uh, we have people in drug courts. We have people today who I guess the latest hottest thing is the opioid epidemic where people claim to get addicted to drugs because of their doctors or medical care. Um, and we have uh, parole after prison, post-prison, 
the worse they trust you in society with some supervision. And then, of course, you have prison, which you are confined. Uh, do you think there's any real difference within crimes, within, uh, within violations, uh, within uh, penalties that would alter uh, your view of uh, that type of uh, total blank ban on voting or jury duty or, or anything like that? And if anybody could chime in after he responds, I'd love to hear it. Well, yeah, I think, you know, Virginia used to have a, until Governor McCall changed it, you know, Virginia had, I think it was, the, it was, you could, you can in essence pretty much get your right to vote back after three years for a nonviolent felony and five years for a violent felony. And I think the, the main showing you had to make and the application you filed, and, and look, I, I agree completely, it should not be a complicated process at all. You know, you should not have to hire a lawyer. You should be able to fill out a, a short form and send it back. And I think the idea was that was the governor's office would look at it. And if if you have beaten the statistics, right, you know, two thirds within three years, three quarters within five years are rearrested. If you've been clean for three years, you've been clean for five years, that's a that's a sign that you have learned your lesson, that you have turned your life around and that you're now willing to live by the rules that previously you intentionally broke. And under those circumstances, then, yeah, I think you ought to get your right to vote back. I actually think you should get your ability to sit in the jury box back. There's all kinds of other rights I think you ought to be able to get back because the decision's been made that you, you showed that you turned over a new leaf and have changed your judgment and the way you do things. And I think it's not just the right to vote, but many of these other rights that should be restored. Isn't, uh, isn't that the point of the, the sentence in the first place? I mean, are, are, don't some of these things run with the sentence, meaning that um, people are sentenced to a period of time, a period of years, and presumably if the criminal justice system is rational, the sentence that they receive bears some connection. Some might argue that it's excessive, but it right. may bear some connection to the crime that they've committed. So I'm, I'm wondering why there is um, such a focus on excluding them from, temp from attempting to rejoin the polity and be focused in the duties of citizenship. Why, why is that such a special thing after somebody has come outside and is living among us? Right. Well, Commissioner, you're, uh, you're making the assumption that society has decided that time in prison and perhaps parole is the only punishment you're going to get for committing a serious crime. And we as a society uh, have decided that there are a whole series of other collateral, collateral consequences besides prison time, besides court fines, you know, uh, orders of restitution. Now, I would, I would completely agree with you and many of the panelists here that there are a number of collateral, uh, collateral consequences that should be gotten rid of and that don't make sense. Um, but we as a society have decided that time in prison is not the only punishment that we're going to impose. If we as a society or a particular state wants to change that, they've got the ability to do it. But, but uh, prison time is not the only punishment that we, we for a long time have imposed. I think that's the conception of this whole presentation today is that we're, we're all aware of the fact that there are collateral consequences, that they have been with us for a long time. We heard references to Greece, I think, earlier this morning and, and other contexts. So I think we take that on board, that there are collateral consequences. Uh, I, I think what we're trying to get to is that many, as we've heard today, of the collateral consequences are of such a degree of tenuousness that it's hard for people to understand right. the nexus between the penalty and any good government purpose. Well, and I, and, and I, I think that's I really what we're trying to drive at, not the idea about whether or not there right. can be collateral consequences. And, and that, that's all day's topic. I understand. But I think the right to vote is, is directly tied into that because of what I have said. And I, I don't want to repeat myself since we have limited time. But, but again, the point is, is that when you commit a felony, you have intentionally and knowingly broken the rules of the society that you live in. And I think taking away your ability in the voting booth to decide what those rules are going to be, I think there's a direct connection between the two. Uh, I know Mr. Maurer has something to say, so. Yeah, sure. 
if I could just add, well. you know, it, it strikes me if we start to talk about trustworthiness or being of good character, it's a fairly slippery slope for voting qualifications. Uh, you know, there are many kinds of behaviors that are not criminal in themselves, but I wouldn't think make very good character. Someone is admitted racist, homophobic, anti-Semitic. Uh, you know, if you're up to me, I wouldn't want that person voting because I don't think they would exercise good judgment, but it's not up to me. You know, that's what democracy is all about. Uh, and uh, I don't know how many people we'd have left if we started employing those kinds of character tests for voting. I would also add, what does that character test necessarily prove? Does it prove that you are trustworthy and upstanding that you've been three years without involvement in the system, or does it does it suggest maybe that you just didn't get caught for whatever it is you might be doing? Uh, I have I, I want to address one more uh, issue with what you said about uh, uh, recidivism. I guess that's what you were talking about: three to five years, beat the odds, blah blah blah. I know about odds. Uh, You're so, from Nevada. <laughs> <laughs> if we get, uh, if we if we set aside these other uh, collateral consequences, would that assist these people in beating the odds you're talking about? I mean, would that help them uh, with their issue of trustworthiness or repetition? Well, I'm assuming, for example, uh, one of the most fundamental rights we have in this country, a very fundamental civil right, is the right to work and support ourselves. And I think that's a very important right. On the other hand, you know, I do understand the concerns of employers, uh, particularly on the negligent hiring issue that we've seen before. Uh, if they hire someone who then um, injures a customer or something else, of them getting sued over that. So I can understand the concerns of, of employers. Um, but I think the ability to, to be employed is a fundamental civil right. And I think... Uh, it helps you stay out of trouble. Uh, well, it certainly does. And I think many of the state boards that decide whether you can get a license in a particular profession, uh, I agree completely with what earlier people said. Many times they're just looking for a way to keep competition out of their particular profession. So you would agree then that that would help people who are out of, the, who, who finish up their, their time, whether it's probation or... Yeah, potentially so. But on the other hand, for example, if you are a bank, uh, I can see why, and you would have a common sense and reasonable grounds not to hire an embezzler. Well, obviously, it, it, I, mean, I, I don't think anybody would argue with you on that. As, well, some people, some Mr. Maurer might. Well, I, I, I think uh, I, we, we had that uh, discussion when we did our uh, employment hiring uh, thing with the ban the box, right? And it was it was clear that uh, you know you don't hire an embezzler straight out of prison take the job and in consideration you take time that's fast and you take the offense right I mean that's common sense I, 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 I don't think anybody here is throwing look, that out Commissioner well look what I would say about all of this is look I don't have a problem with for example Vermont and Maine having made the decision they're going to allow felons in prison to continue voting I don't have a problem with states who want to automatically restore that right I also don't have a problem with states who say we want to have a waiting period to see if they get over you know, the recidivism rate and the, the, the repetition. My point is, is that all of those, I think all of those approaches are reasonable based on what the people in that state want to do. And I think it's, it's common sense and reasonable, for example, if the small number of states that do that actually want to have a waiting period before they restore it. I just want to make sure that the vice chair has had a chance to ask questions if you have any. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, but I believe that uh, Mr. Spakowski has uh, clarified his position well enough that it's taken care of um, of the question that I had. But I have to say that throughout this, uh, what's been echoing in my mind is uh, Jean Valjean uh, in uh, the book many of us read many years ago, Les Miserables, saying, uh, you know, words to the effect that I've served my sentence and now my punishment begins. Um, that's exactly what uh, what we see is going on. But no, um, my question has been answered. Thank you. I see Commissioner Dagley has another question. Forgive me. Um, uh, so, 
Mr. Maurer, could you speak to me about whether or not, and speak to all of us, as a matter of fact. Um, it, 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 it doesn't just need to be between the two of us. We'll, we'll, we'll let others in on our secret. Um, but, but could you speak to us about um, this issue of the reliability of data? My understanding is that there has been some litigation that has revealed that some of these felon disfranchisement lists have the impact of disenfranchising eligible voters because the match criteria that are applied on the lists are, are not adequate. We heard some of this echoed on this morning's pa um, panel. I'm wondering if it has implications in the voting area. Yeah, no, there, it's, uh, it's a very significant issue and is one other related one. The, the most uh, high, high level, high profile period, of course, was in the historic uh, 2000 election, presidential election in Florida, in addition to the many, many other controversies there, was the uh, election list that was contracted out to provide the state with a list of people with felony convictions. Uh, the uh, error rate was huge and included in one county the, uh, the director of elections for the county who did not have a felony conviction himself. So the error rate is very high. Uh, there's also, uh, related to this, an enormous amount of misunderstanding of these policies, and it happens on both sides of the issue. People go in to register to vote. They're told by a clerk they can't vote, even though that's not the policy in that state. And down the road, they go in to vote, and they're able to vote, even though they're not supposed to be able to vote in that state. That's one of the reasons why there's a movement among many to say that anyone who's not incarcerated should be able to vote in addition to questions about democracy and other concerns uh it makes life much simpler for election officials and everyone else if you're physically able to walk into city hall then you're eligible to register to vote and it would eliminate this uh confusion and uh you know sometimes illegal activities that are unknowingly taking place Thank you very much again to this panel. We are just at time, but this was uh, unbelievably productive, and I really appreciate the research and the materials that you submitted in advance and your testimony today. Thank you. Uh, we will now take a break for lunch. We will meet back for our next panel promptly at 1.15. And I look forward to the rest of the day.